I have 630, please proceed your worship. Uh, thank you, Randy, appreciate that. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. It is uh, 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, April 6th. I hope everyone had a good Easter. And I'll begin this meeting by formally recognizing the traditional keepers of this land and specifically our neighbors of the Alderville First Nation with a formal territorial acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that the municipality of Brighton is located on the Mississauga Anishinaabek territory and is the traditional territory of the Mississauga. The Council of the Municipality of Brighton respectfully acknowledges that the Mississauga Nation are the collective stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. I will also advise that due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting will be held by electronic conference technology. Members of Council and staff are all engaging in tonight's meeting through video conference. The public is invited to join us by viewing this meeting live on the Municipality of Brighton YouTube channel. I will also note that once we proceed into closed session, the live YouTube stream will end for the duration of tonight's council meeting. With that, we'll move to the approval of the agenda and the motion reads that council approved the April 6, 2021 council meeting agenda as presented. Is there a mover? Council Rowley, seconded by Councillor Bateman. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, uh, members of council, please unmute yourselves. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tagman? You're muted, Mary. Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura <clears throat> Bank? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Thank you. And members of council, if you please state any declarations of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. There are none noted. Are there any announcements this evening? Councilor LeBlanc? I will make announcement that the uh, the bunny hoppers have reached their goal for Easter and raised uh, with the with the with the residents and the businesses. Uh, they fulfilled uh, over 120 baskets for the seniors in the three different senior residence homes. Thank you. Good work. Good work to that group that did that, Councillor LeBlanc. Yes. Councillor Bateman. Uh, I just want to announce uh, from Brighton Minor Hockey standpoint, something we started more than two years ago now and subsequently the Human Rights Commission got involved across Ontario with Indigenous logos, but I'm quite proud of uh, Brighton Minor Hockey because we were ahead of the curve and I'd like to announce tonight that there is a new logo, new color scheme, and they will be unveiled this weekend. So kudos to the entire hockey organization for staying ahead of that. They kept going despite meeting, you know, like we are now and not being able to do things in person, but it didn't slow anything down. So all our teams will be sporting new logos and new colors next year. We've completely moved away from the Indigenous logo. Good work and thanks to Brighton Minor Hockey for that. It uh, it, it helps the municipality uh, move along. As, as you know, as everyone knows, we did receive a letter from the Ontario Human Rights Commission asking us to create policy around this uh, concern. So um, kudos, as I say, to Brighton Minor Hockey for heading down that road. Councilor Bateman, when, when and where is the unveiling of the new logo and colors? I, I could probably message them more. They're still playing with that because we got thrown the curveball with uh, the stuff, but they're hoping to try to do it, you know, virtually doing it live by filming it in the parking lot. But uh, that's a discussion we'll have to have with the director. If that's okay. going to be about. I'll wait to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other announcements? So with that, we'll move into the adoption of the minutes. And the first motion will read that council adopt the March 15th, 2021 council meeting minutes as presented. Is there a mover? Moved by Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Deputy Mayor Vink. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. <clears throat> Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? 
Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. The next motion reads that council adopt the March 29th, 2021 special council meeting minutes. No, not the letter order. 22nd, March 22nd, 2021 special council meeting minutes as presented. Remover, Council Rowley, second. Deputy Mayor Vink, is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And that's carried. And the final adoption is that Council adopt the March 29th, 2021 Special Council Meeting Minutes as presented. Is there a mover? Move Councillor Anderson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Vink. Is there any discussion? Adam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowling? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Brian Ostrander. Yes. Carried. Thank you. We have no statutory public meeting this evening, so that takes us into delegations. We have two delegations, one from the County of Northumberland and one from the uh, from WSP Consultant Project Manager for the MCO. Uh, so I will open the floor for uh, CAO Moore from the County to Give us your presentation, CAO. I remind members of council that there will be an opportunity to uh, ask questions of clarification after the delegation. If your questions, which I think were submitted, were did not get answered, or you have additional questions, you may ask them then. Um, and we'll just uh, see if uh, Mr. Dees and Ms. Moore can manage themselves on the hot seat. Welcome to Brighton virtually, CAO. Thank you, Mayor Ostrander. Uh, we, we are pleased, of course, to be here to do, uh, I guess, our roadshow. This is our, our kickoff for 2021. Um, I've uh, had the opportunity to do this for many years now, uh, and we're, of course, glad to be back after a, a, we, we missed a few last year because of uh, everyone getting accustomed to uh, virtual meetings, but we're now back, and, and Brighton is uh, the first of, of this season. So I'm, of course, here tonight along with Glenn East, who's our Director of Finance, and we will go through... Um, the uh, the presentation, um, I believe it's before you. I don't know, um, Candace. Are, are we going to show the presentation, or do you want me to just speak to it? Does Council need it brought up? She can share her screen if you would like. I yeah. I, I don't. I actually don't don't have it up. Oh. I didn't know if it, if it was available or I can. They do have it in their package. Yes. Have a copy. I can just speak to it. Okay. Um, so I'll I'll move to to the second slide. The presentation outline. Um, we uh, will start with a bit of a, a look back uh, of 2020, uh, and then we'll um, we'll talk a little bit about 2021, and finally, uh, Glenn will speak a little bit to the budget and, and hit some of those highlights. Uh, I know everyone uh, is is a little bit curious. Um, we do have the presentation with all of the uh, the photos and pictures in it. And, uh, and I will just uh, let everyone know that we're very aware of, of masking and distancing. And some of those photos don't have masks on people. Um, they are some of our stock photos that we have from our operations. Uh, and, uh, and we're very careful to make sure that only those that uh, are properly masked or distance are, are in our operation today. So um, just uh, if you see those, we, we, uh, we are aware and, and those are some historical photos that we're showing. Uh, the, uh, the next slide, slide three, uh, we always do remind everybody the county's vision is to be as uh, to bring together people, partnerships and possibilities for a strong and vibrant Northumberland, uh, along with our mission, that's to be a best practices leader of county government and a collab collaborative partner with our member municipalities, uh, with our municipalities and community partners. We, of course, have four key priorities uh, in our strategic plan. It's economic prosperity and innovation, sustainable growth thriving in inclusive communities and leadership in change. And as we go through the presentation, 
I'll speak to uh, some of our achievements um, in 2020 from that, uh, that perspective. Uh, the next slide is uh, regarding COVID-19, and, and I think that uh, we have put in uh, a couple of slides to speak to COVID because, of course, uh, I don't think any of us could talk about um, 2020 without acknowledging some of the work that has occurred um, as uh, just uh, in early, early last year, um, we saw the pandemic hit, and of course, we all had to um, change course, or the, I guess the word of the day is pivot, and, uh, and look at how we could deliver our services um, differently in, in many ways. So the, the first slide has, again, some great photos of, of what we were able to do around the community. Uh, our social services uh, team reacted quickly. Uh, within 48 hours, they were able to relocate our shelter um, because, of course, we couldn't properly distance um, in the current uh, transition house shelter. And they set that up in the uh, Coburg Collegiate Institute, the, the high school, uh, and they were able to provide um, those services. And of course, they also uh, worked to ensure that we could uh, deliver emergency child care services for frontline workers. IT, like all of uh, all the municipalities and many businesses, had to uh, figure out a way to very quickly see our workforce, uh, office work staff anyway, uh, become remote. Um, but most of our, our team did have to continue to do um, their work um, at their regular work location. The Golden Plow, uh, long-term care, we of course can't um, talk about COVID without that. We um, have uh, been able to uh, get through the past year without any of our residences, our residents contracting the virus. And at this point, 96% of our resident po population are now fully vaccinated. Uh, and uh, we are of course keeping all of our infection control practices um, in place and will continue to do so um, under the, the direction of, of the province. Uh, we've also been uh, a partner with both the testing centers and vaccination now uh, throughout our community and our paramedics have certainly uh, stepped up and participated in that. Emergency preparedness was, of course, a very, very busy activity, um, as well as working with um, getting all of our, our frontline staff. So uh, our waste management services, of course, had to um, change the way they could do their operations with ensuring they had the tools that they need needed. And uh, we also, uh, like you, had to go virtual for, for council. Um, the, the next slide, again, some, some more photos of some of the things we, we were doing around the county um, during COVID. Tourism, uh, a big part, and looking at how we could uh, do hyper-local um, tourism promotion to make sure that we weren't attracting folks out of uh, other hot zones, um, but still ensuring that we could support uh, local businesses to the, the greatest extent possible and safe. Uh, finance, we did receive significant funding, but with that comes a lot of reporting, so they were quite busy. Our provincial offenses team uh, have now gone to virtual courts, uh, and they, they did have to shift to that. Uh, and uh, all of our operations from payroll, our back office staff, of course, have had to uh, do a lot of work, and even some of our um, staff like archives and museums got creative and they're actually capturing COVID-19 stories so that in the future we will have a good uh, community memory of just how we reacted to this pandemic. Uh, another really positive story was at the Agri-Food Venture Centre where the kitchens were used to make over 18,000 servings of soup that was then distributed throughout the community uh, with the United Way in, in a partnership there as well as through the Food for All warehouse. So this is not an exhaustive list, and I know that uh, so many of our, our organizations had to step up through the pandemic, uh, but it gives you a highlight of some of the hard work that, that folks did across the county to ensure that uh, our residents continue to receive the county services. Uh, I'm now on the, uh, the slide entitled A Look Back 2020 in Review, and I'll go through each one of our uh, main uh, priorities from our strategic plan and touch on some highlights from that area. So looking at economic prosperity and innovation, um, we did see that uh, some of our strategy around economic development needed to uh, change slightly as we uh, saw the pandemic hit last year, and uh, that became a significant focus um, as, as we looked at what uh, our priorities needed to be in economic development. We did convene the Economic Recovery Task Force, where over 60 businesses and community stakeholders contributed to that project. Uh, we identified an, a number of activities um, that would assist our business community in um, getting through the pandemic as well as uh, how they could um, launch into the recovery. 
broadband, of course, was a key highlight of that, uh, and certainly the uh, leading initiative that was identified. Uh, we have, from that, done a significant research and developed our, our broadband strategy, and this does see the county taking on a role uh, where we can, can support improvements uh, around broadband uh, and forming some um, both, both partnerships uh, with the private sector, uh, as well as um, seeking government funding opportunities to build that infrastructure and see those services roll out in the future. Uh, we also had the Digital Northumberland Initiative, uh, where we um, administered funding that went out to local businesses to see them increase their online presence, enhance their website, and drive business through online services. Uh, we also know that the um, that the, the pandemic had a dis disproportionate impact on women and youth. So some of the uh, programs in economic development were certainly targeted to that group through the Women Entrepreneurship uh, Program and the Starter Company Programs. Um, they helped 45 women and youth entrepreneurs locally grow their businesses. I, I did mention tourism. Um, we have had to do some uh, shift there when we look at how we uh, focus our campaigns um, instead of traditional visitor markets, it's the hyper-local and neighboring markets that they've moved their focus to. And they've worked with about 160 stakeholders in tourism um, to, to try and launch that. They've also been working closely with the tourism operators, had resources for website enhancement, uh, pushed out resources around travel and tourism, health and safety protocols to assist those businesses uh, and secured um, funding that they have been able to use for um, local tourism marketing campaigns. So there's been significant work that has happened there. Looking next at the uh, priority of sustainable growth, uh, it was quite exciting to see that despite the pandemic, many of our key priorities were able to move forward uh, throughout the year. Uh, we did kick off the Northumberland Next initiative, uh, which is uh, to update uh, the uh, official plan. There is actually a public uh, virtual open, uh, uh, virtual public meeting tomorrow morning that will occur. And of course, there, we're still um, open to input through the, the website and, and through our planning department. Uh, we did uh, approve, complete our first uh, development charges background study and approve the bylaw. So DCs are now in place countywide. We also had some significant infrastructure projects that got kicked off. Uh, we certainly um, are all very aware of the Golden Plow Lodge. We've been talking about um, that project now for a number of years, and there is a lot of earth that has been moved to just uh, not uh, a few hundred feet from where I'm sitting right now, uh, and we can actually um, see that, that work going forward. Um, they're starting to put pipes in the ground, and next step will be a foundation. So a lot of excitement around that project. We uh, have engaged the public and we've got to about a 30% complete uh, de detailed design for the Campbellford Bridge, another project that has been many years in the making, but is really moving forward at, at this point in time. Uh, we've also looked at um, some of our, our more, um, I guess, infrastructure type, type work. Uh, we did about 95 kilometers of surface treatment this year. Uh, about 75 of those kilometers were member municipalities, the balance being county roadways. Uh, we also saw the completion and opening of the uh, Campbellford uh, Joint Emergency Services Base, where um, the county uh, paramedics are now co-located with the fire department, uh, as well as the um, new administrative uh, council chambers for the municipality of Trent Hills. And then I think everybody is also very aware of the launch of the Recycle Right program, uh, as we saw that roll out uh, across the county to the two stream recycling uh, organics collection. Everything is now fully implemented for that program and that should see us divert about 3000 tons of waste annually from our landfill. And this should result in about four to five years of additional life for that landfill, taking us out to um, the mid, uh, to about 2035 is, is what our current estimate is. Uh, to the next priority is a thriving and inclusive communities. Um, First on the list has to be community paramedicine. And uh, when we did the announcement uh, very early last year uh, to launch community paramedicine, when we received that funding, uh, we still had no idea about the pandemic. Uh, and it has really given us uh, great legs to respond um, throughout the past year in what our community paramedics have been able to deliver to the community um, through their additional supports and, and outreach. It has been fabulous. Uh, it's also been great to see um, those folks be uh, a really uh, integral part of the Ontario health team 
Northumberland and get that initiative up off the ground as well. Uh, affordable housing, uh, I know this is, is certainly an item that um, this council has been talking about and we do have some questions later on that um, that we'll, we'll answer. We did see um, significant work with the affordable housing strategy completed in 2020. Uh, we also uh, did receive funding for the Elgin Park project. We should break ground on that um, this summer. And we've also started in the planning work last year for the Ontario uh, Street project for housing in, in Coburg as well, uh, because of the, the very high demands there. Uh, housing and homelessness, of course, we also did quite a bit there. And with uh, the benefit of additional uh, funding, we were able to open up daytime and evening warming rooms. Uh, that's the first time we've been able to offer that service. Uh, we've also launched the Next Steps program, which is a true transitional housing program intended to give some of the life stabilization supports and skills that folks need to move from homeless into homelessness into stable long-term permanent housing. Uh, and that program is off to a very good start at this point. We've also been working uh, a fair bit with the provincial under the provincial direction of modernization of social services. And we're seeing um, a, a lot of uh, new initiatives come out uh, being driven by the province and, and looking at how we're delivering those services from more online services and, and how clients can access those services um, and looking at um, paperless, uh, how they can uh, interact with their caseworker in more ways uh, versus always coming in for visits, uh, as well as what we, we see with the changes in employment services moving away from the structure, the structure that has been at the county um, into, um, uh, in, in our case, a, a program supported by Fleming College. And in the, uh, the final priority around leadership and change, again, a number of initiatives being advanced there. The digital strategy, of course, being a key offering programming to enhance the digital literacy skills of our residents and many of those programs had significant uptake. We also, um, once again, uh, published our annual report. We did win a Marcom Gold Award for communication for that design and presentation. Uh, and uh, we also made advanced in our strategic priority to strengthen public engagement. So we now have the Join in Northumberland um, program, which is launched. It's on our website. Um, many of you are familiar with the Bang the Table software. That's what it is based on. Um, and of course, we, we did mention the planning and that's where that consult consultation is based out of. Uh, we're also moving to, uh, to more public consultation uh, and accessibility to our meetings. We did change the format uh, of our council governance structure. So now we have committees that are open to the public uh, and where delegations can be made. Uh, we did also did a service delivery review that was completed for a number of our departments and services. This was funded by modernization funding from the province and it identified opportunities for revenue generating as well as some direct savings and uh, opportunities for productivity uh, savings to be reinvested into our operations. So it was a very busy year uh, and we were very pleased to, to be able to say that the vast majority of our work plan was able to um, advance in, in spite of, of COVID. Looking ahead to 2021, uh, again, many of these projects are, are continuing on. So I'm now on to what's labeled as slide 13. Um, and I'll just quickly go through some of these uh, highlights, uh, of course, um, partnerships, as I had mentioned, um, to see us move forward and advance our, um, our opportunities for broadband connectivity. And uh, we are hopeful that we will uh, we'll see that advance. We're looking at intermunicipal collaboration for tourism, and we've already kickstarted that with a consultation meeting with all of the member municipal staff participating uh, for those that work in the, set, in the area of tourism. Uh, we will also continue to focus our training for our business and entrepreneurship center to see our small businesses um, continue to um, come out of the, the, the uh, pandemic uh, on the other side and, and hopefully see them um, succeed as, as they exit the pandemic. I, I had mentioned also community paramedicine and there's um, more work there to grow that program with the support of the Ontario Health Team rolling out initiatives like um, the patient remote patient monitoring uh, that is a program that we're seeing some very early successes with uh, as we're, we're helping people stay in their homes um, not needing to go to as many appointments also being able to avoid significant numbers of emergency 911 calls by 
being able to proactively go out and, and work with patients. So uh, there's a number of other activities that that program will launch as we get out into the community. Uh, and it also very much looks at supporting not just urban, but also our rural residents as we bring more healthcare out to them. Uh, I did mention that we will uh, break ground this year on the Elgin Park project, which is taking our current 18 units of uh, social or community housing, and that will be rebuilt uh, in a couple of phases and be 40 units. Um, those are a combination of one, two, three, and four bedroom units uh, where uh, one of the, the few buildings where we do have family units. Uh, we'll also see our affordable housing options um, advance further in the community with the, the launch of the capital incentives program looking to uh, bring other non-government um, agencies to the table and, and be a, a partner in uh, the creation of more affordable housing. The community safety and well-being plan continues to progress and of course that's a, an initiative that we are all uh, in municipalities required to do but we're doing so collaboratively with the county taking the lead on that. Um, so a lot of a lot of things happening there. We'll also see um, the ongoing construction of the uh, Golden Plow Lodge and Northumberland County Archives and Museum. Uh, that construction will occur throughout 2021 uh, and into 2022. We hope to move in in the fall. Uh, there is an, an e-newsletter that's available if anybody wants to, to keep updates. We're already seeing some fairly impressive footage um, from uh, the constructor's drone and seeing the, the evolution of the site even over the past couple months, it's quite um, impressive to see a building of this size um, being in, constructed in, in our community. Uh, we will continue to advance the, the work for the uh, Campbellford Bridge. And we have, of course, our usual uh, program of road and bridge uh, work that we'll see throughout the county from paving projects to, to bridge rehabilitation. Uh, and we're continuing to work on the uh, re Recycle uh, Right program as we continue to roll that out and, and uh, ensure that it's, it's working effectively. Uh, I had mentioned earlier the Enhanced Natural Heritage System. Uh, and as I, I did mention, there will be uh, ongoing community consultation with a uh, public meeting tomorrow morning. Um, this is uh, an, an update to our official plan. Uh, and uh, you can see all of those documents um, that there, there is um, significant um, background information that is posted on, on the website uh, for you to view. As part of our um, consultation efforts, we're also going to be launching a, a participatory budgeting solution this year. Uh, we are in the process of setting up that software. Uh, it will give the public an opportunity to, to see some of the inner workings of, of how the budget's developed to look at targets. Uh, and as they, they make some decisions, uh, they can uh, experience uh, the, the trade-offs and the tough decisions that are required to hit those targets. Um, so we'll, we'll see that happening as well as the development of a framework for multi-year budgeting um, at the county. Um, we will also continue with the implementation of the recommendations from our service delivery review and continue to implement um, lean uh, practices as we continue to strive to be efficient. As I mentioned earlier, provincial, provincial offenses courts are now launched and they will be functioning virtually uh, and uh, we'll continue to work on our digital strategy. So that is a very, very quick rundown of some of the highlights. Uh, Glenn will quickly go over uh, some of the, uh, the, the summary of the budget uh, and then uh, we will speak to the specific questions that we did receive in advance. So Glenn, over to you. All right, um, so good evening, everybody. Um, we have a couple slides in respect to the to, to the budget. So, uh, if you if you flip over uh, the first page that you'll you'll see is um, or actually the, the next two slides are coming right from an infographic that we normally would would provide when we when we come and visit uh, councils for for the annual update. But um, but the infographic is available on on our website, and I'm just going to touch on a, a couple of a couple of the highlights. So um, in December, County Council approved the the 2021 Northumberland County budget. Um, you'll see here that the total approved budget this year is 188.4 million. And you can see from the, the pie chart as well at the top left how this amount is broken out between our operating budget, capital budget, as well as transfers um, to, to reserves. So at $188 million, this is by no means an insignificant municipal budget and really is represent, representative of the uh, county being a full service upper tier, upper tier municipality with uh, capital intensive services 
and labor intensive services as, as well, such as the 24 seven operations that we have for the Golden Plow Lodge uh, and, and as well uh, within our paramedics department. At the top right, you will see that the total county um, levy this year or, or the amount of property tax, tax assessed by the county is 60.4 million, which amounts to about an $18 increase to the median household uh, within Northumberland. The levy increase uh, you'll see represents 1.58% after growth. And this is comprised of uh, an increase dedicated to infrastructure investment of 0.64%, and then the base levy increase itself of 0.94%. So those, those two items represent the total uh, after growth increase of 1.58% for the year. Uh, it's important to note that the, the uncontrollable or committed items within the base levy for the year represented a 2.9% a increase alone at the onset of the budgetary process. A large portion of this really was attributable to 2021 being the first full year of the new waste collection contract for uh, organics and two stream recycling. So staff did provide for two days of detailed uh, budget deliberations with county council uh, with the final outcome uh, with the budgetary approval coming in at the 0.94% uh, that you see here. Uh, so below this, there is a further breakdown of how the county funds our, our various programs and services. So revenues from property taxes and government grants to user fees and POA fines. You'll see by the um, by the green bar in the chart here that the grants and subsidies uh, represents uh, 42.9 million of, our, of, our, of the county budget or approximately 35% of our revenue sources. So this, this really does highlight for the county the, the risks uh, the risk to the county from any uh, possible future years reductions that we could see to provincial funding that really is tied to the delivery of, of, of mandate, mandatory programs that the, the county is required to, to provide for. Uh, as part of the 2021 budgetary process, uh, the county also reviewed uh, with council discretionary items within the budget, which uh, really highlighted that there, there is very little that is not uh, either mandatory or a core municipal service that the county does provide for. Uh, then below this, you can see um, specifically how the property tax portion of our budget is spent by service area. So again, this is specific to uh, the levy portion of our budget and how it's allocated by services. You'll see that roads is the largest with its capital program and maintenance activities. Uh, social services uh, follows. So it's, it's important to note here that that even though much of the social services program delivery is funded by different provincial uh, ministries, uh, much of it really requires a form of, of cost matching as well. So although we do receive funds from provincial ministries, in many cases, uh, there is a levy requirement tied to providing that, uh, to, pro to providing that program delivery. Uh, the county uh, budgetary process always focuses on the, the long term providing for a 10-year long-term plan. This really ensures that council has visibility over, over the long-term and not looking at a, the current year budget in, in, in isolation. And, and just to provide some, some perspective on, on the impacts uh, long-term to the county budget from, from reductions that take place, uh, a 1% reduction within the current year budget uh, translates to a, a cumulative impact of, of $7.1 million in lost financial capacity over the 10 years cumulatively. So that, that's just a 1% reduction in one year. However, um, if we take a 1% uh, reduction each year of the 10 years of our, of our 10 year model, that translates into a lost financial uh, capacity of 40.6 million cumulatively over, over 10 years. So it's important to council, for council to see the, the, the impacts uh, from, from their decisions, both short-term and long-term, recognizing the, the needs that we have identified within our long-term model. Uh, for some context, the, the, the average for the average home, 1% uh, of, of the county uh, levy represents approximately $12. So, so if, if we flip over to the, the next slide, uh, within our 10-year our financial plan here, you'll see that we have a number of major construction fleet and equipment projects identified, and we continue to allocate funds to reserves every year to help finance the cost of these projects uh, when, it, when, they're, when, it's, when it's time for uh, these projects to take place. 
But one challenge we have to contend with in our financial planning model is that the cost estimates for these projects are subject to, to change due to cost escalations from uh, inflation, particularly around construction activities, uh, as well uh, within the current environment with the pandemic, uh, along with uncertainty uh, in provincial funding levels. So we are constantly reviewing and making revisions to, to our plan uh, as necessary. And, the, and this 10-year model is updated as part of each, each uh, budgetary cycle. For social housing, we have funds allotted in 2021 for the Elgin Park redevelopment and expansion and further placeholders in the long-term capital plan for future years projects. Uh, another challenge that we, we face along with municipalities across Ontario is an ongoing infrastructure uh, deficit where the financing we require to maintain, rehabilitate and construct our roads, bridges and other infrastructure continues to outpace available funds. In 2015, we did introduce um, a levy uh, dedicated specifically for infrastructure, uh, which is helping us to gain some ground in, in this, this area. And this is uh, in relation to the 0.64 dedicated infrastructure investment that we see for 2021. Uh, Council's uh, 2020 adoption of countywide development charge is another tool that will help to finance uh, requirements related to the growth of our community. And this really is ensuring that, that growth pays for growth and that our existing tax base is, is not bearing the burden of, of those costs that we have identified specifically uh, for growth coming into in Northumberland County. So lastly, uh, and this is uh, just a note in regards to, to tax policy, I'll mention that the county um, has eliminated for uh, 2021, the property tax discounts on commercial and industrial vacant and excess lands. Uh, shifting these tax savings onto productive or occupied commercial and industrial properties. Uh, this really is aligned uh, with, with what the province has done with their treatment of education taxes, specifically for vacant and excess lands, and really is, uh, is, is common across Ontario with what other municipalities are implementing uh, or have already um, implemented. So that ends the, um, the formal portion of uh, the presentation. As Jennifer mentioned, there were some, um, some questions that were forwarded to us, so we can address those um, now. And then um, subsequent to that, we can take any uh, further questions or address any uh, comments that you have uh, after we answer those, those, those specific questions that we received. So- I'll let you both carry on and answer the, um, the, the, the pre-received questions, if you will. Right, okay. So Jennifer uh, has has the, the first question. So I'll turn it over to you, Jennifer. Hey, I'll tackle the first one. Uh, we did receive a question regarding the housing crisis and the inadequate supply of affordable and or subsidized housing in Brighton uh, and wondering if there were uh, plans to build more subsidized housing um, and, and if not, if, if we could, could explain. So uh, a little bit of background, uh, the county does have 58 units um, that are subsidized currently in Brighton. 57 are owned and operated by the Northumberland County, Ho County Housing Corporation, and one is a rent supplement unit. Uh, the wait list is about six years in Brighton. This is the fourth, um, fourth highest. Um, fo it, it follows Coburg, Port Hope, and Trent Hills that all have longer wait lists at the current moment. So um, I guess Brighton kind of falls in, in the middle when we look at all seven uh, member municipalities as far as their, their current wait list. Um, so it shows that it really uh, Northumberland is experiencing the same challenges as almost every community across the province and across the country in, in that there is insufficient um, affordable housing for, for many people. Um, in addition to building, I did mention in, in the presentation that there's the Elgin Park uh, redevelopment project uh, that is underway. We have already received funding uh, for a portion of that. The county will fund a portion and we will um, borrow for a portion. Uh, that should be start construction later this summer. Uh, there is a second uh, project that is in the early development phases, um, also in Coburg, um, and that is a partnership between the county um, habitat for North Habitat for Humanity Northumberland, as well as the Ontario Aboriginal Housing uh, Corporation, and um, it, it'll it'll be developing shortly after uh, Elgin Park. They're currently in the um, in the discussions around how the partnership will work and looking at early funding applications for design and pre work, uh, and then we'll we'll move from there. Um, in addition to, to construction opportunities, there are other tools that can hopefully incentivize uh, private sector developers 
Um, so that could be um, tax, uh, tax increment equivalent grants or TEGs is what we call them. Um, the capital incentive program um, could be waiving development charges. So there's a number of tools that, that can be uh, put in place and uh, currently working on a structure for those. Although with the current hot market uh, for housing, it is difficult to provide that incentive to the private sector and see them move into uh, deeply affordable units. Um, some might move into modest or slightly affordable, but the deeply affordable, um, it, it's challenging to incentivize that. Um, hence why we see um, often it is left to uh, government to construct those, those units. Uh, when we look at the future, I think we are looking for opportunities in the municipalities. Uh, we have uh, been meeting with uh, member municipal staff across the county from our, our housing uh, manager meets with them. Uh, they, there is um, uh, tailored uh, affordable housing strategies that each municipality did receive last year um, to give them some tools and, and for them to, to work uh, on affordable housing. We know that this is um, a challenge that all levels of government will need to work together in order to address it. Um, no one level of government is going to be able to solve it. And we're certainly um, looking forward to and open to partnerships. Uh, what we need at this point are land opportunities. Um, the county does not have any additional lands in our land bank. Um, but once we finish the two projects that are currently identified, um, there isn't anything else in the queue at the moment. So we will be looking for other opportunities around the county, knowing that the wait list is long everywhere. Um, so we would certainly be looking to reach out and, and start that and have any discussions uh, with municipalities that um, can, can partner with us to, to move forward. So that's that's um, kind of the highlights on where we're at with, with housing. Um, the next question we received was uh, wondering uh, how much Brighton pays Northumberland County for economic development and what opportunities and promotion this provided to Brighton. Um, I guess uh, just a, a little bit to clarify um, the funding model, um, this is um, a, a county levy, so the funding contribution is through the levy, meaning it's assessed by the county. There are other places um, in the county where services are a shared service or, or a contracted type service where a municipality um, chooses to partner with the county, um, such as IT or something along those lines. Uh, in this case, economic development is, a, is funded through a direct levy. Um, so the, uh, ba based on the allocation, it's based on assessment. Uh, Brighton is about 12.7% of the total county assessment based on um, the MPAC assessment values and looking at the core economic development budget that would be about $108,000 share uh, if you look at that. When we look at some of um, what's included, I have about three pages here. I won't read through all of that in the interest of time. Um, but some of the highlights, um, there's a number of investment attraction opportunities that have been forwarded to the, the municipal staff. Um, some of the ones over the last few months, a biofuel manufacturer, an aquaculture facility, um, a tire recycling operator, a beverage manufacturer, a retirement village developer, a meat packer. So there's a, a wide range of those opportunities that, that have been shared. Um, we look at tourism. There's a long list of tourism partnerships that the economic development um, a department works on um, that falls um, under the larger umbrella of, of economic development with tourism, uh, partnering with um, RTO8 and other, um, other um, groups uh, working towards tourism, looking at, as I mentioned uh, during the COVID discussion around that shift to the hyper-local and making sure that Brighton um, tourist um, locations, destinations, uh, restaurants, um, or, or any other locations are included in that marketing effort. There's a number of um, Brighton businesses that do get highlighted. There's a number of video campaigns, things like that, that our tourism group are doing uh, and making sure that Brighton receives um, coverage any, on any of those types of campaigns. Uh, there's settlement services activities that fall under that umbrella that also uh, provide some funding or sorry, not funding, um, some support uh, through uh, the work that they do. That is a, a funded program from the federal government that we operate, uh, but certainly that support goes out to the community. There's the Business uh, and Entrepreneurship Center um, specifically related to Brighton. Um, that program has received significant funding from the province, but we do ensure coverage in Brighton. Um, there's about 28 clients right now that um, are receiving specific service through consultation, guidance, uh, planning and education. We've got about four businesses in the Faster Forward coaching program. 
There's also a number of micro grants and subsidies that have provi been provided um, to help those businesses uh, advance and, and move forward. Uh, there's also a lot that the BECN does around um, opportunities for coaching, training, um, getting it. They did a lot of virtual training and supports this year. There's also the Agri-Food Venture Center that uh, falls under the, this umbrella. And the OAFBC, of course, uh, we all know Saucy Dottie, who has been able to um, establish a, a, a location uh, in, in Brighton uh, as well. So um, there's, there's a lot of activity that does happen um, right across the entire county. And the next question, I think Glenn is going to take. Okay, hey, so um, this question is, uh, how much is paid to Northumberland County for garbage slash recycling services and what slash why specifically the garbage tag program was implemented? So um, the projected 2021 uh, net cost to provide all the various waste management and waste diversion programs throughout the county is approximately $7.9 million. And, and when I say $7.9 million, I mean that that is, uh, what is coming from the county levy towards towards all the waste programs. Um, in addition to the levy, the county expects to generate approximately 3.7 million in revenue from the sale of bag tags. The annual cost to provide roadside collection services for garbage, two-stream recycling, uh, and green bin and leaf and yard waste is approximately $5.4 million um, annually. So the revenue from the sale of bag tags, therefore, it really doesn't cover the entire cost for, for roadside uh, waste collection services. It only funds a portion of this overall cost. Uh, in 2021, the cost to provide waste collection services will amount to approximately um, $130 uh, per household. With the introduction of the new green, green bin program, sorry, the average household is now only buying approximately 21 bag tags per year. So uh, with, with the introduction of, of the green bin, there's obviously less going out for a regular waste pickup. Uh, based on these figures, the average uh, household is funding um, $90 of the overall cost of waste, waste collection services through bag tags, and the remaining $40 is therefore funded through property taxation. So it really is a, a partial user pay system uh, the way it is, is, is built now based on, on the fees that are charged for, for bag tags. Uh, excluding waste collection services, the estimated net cost to provide the other waste management services. Uh, so these are uh, uh, items such as the, the MRF operations, uh, landfill leachate management, our community uh, recycling center operations, household hazardous waste disposal, uh, illegal dumping, uh, education and manage and uh, perpetual care of our eight uh, closed landfills in 2021 amounts to approximately $150 per household for those waste services. So overall then the total amount, uh, the total annual cost for waste management services for the average household for 2021 will be roughly $280. This price includes the purchase of the bag tags. So this equals uh, roughly $5.40 per week per household. So the, the program was implemented um, at some point in the mid um, 1990s uh, to get residents really to, to participate in, in recycling um, when, when it was originally introduced. So therefore it really was a, a financial incentive to, to, to divert waste. And currently as, I, as, what I, as, as what I just explained, it really does represent a partial user pay system uh, currently, but it is still meant to ensure uh, the maximization of, of, of waste diversion. Uh, which really there, therefore extends the, the useful life of our, our one remaining landfill that we have uh, in place uh, within, within Brighton. So it is important to ensure that the amount of waste that is diverted from our, our landfill is really um, maximized so that we can extend the life of, of the Brighton landfill. And I'm just also going to mention very quickly that um, the county is, is required to provide for an estimate of, on our audit, audited financial statements of the future year's liability for landfill closure and post post closure costs, um, and this represents the largest liability on our, on our statement of financial uh, on our statement of financial position at, at 28.1 um, million. So, by no means is it uh, insignificant when we go out uh, looking at, at future years and what's required to remediate and manage uh, our landfill sites once once they're closed. So, with that, the next question is. Uh, for you, I believe, Jennifer. 
Uh, so this question was asking uh, the amount of money that the municipality gives to the county historically over the last four years and wanting to know what percent of that money was in return spent on programs and projects uh, in the municipality of, of Brighton. So um, I, again, um, the, the, uh, the way that the uh, property assessment is calculated, um, it is the same um, ta tax uh, ratios. Um, it, it's the same uh, tax uh, process as what do you have at the, at the lower tier level. So it's based on assessment um, and that assessment of course is set by MPAC. When we look at the uh, relative share of, of Brighton, uh, Brighton is about 12.7% of the total levy uh, based on the way the, the assessment um, falls out across the, the county. If we were to average that out over the past um, four years, that works out to roughly um, $7 million a year is what is assessed on Brighton, um, Brighton property owners um, for their, um, their assessment by the county. Uh, if we were to put that into perspective and look at the average uh, dollar of property tax uh, paid uh, by a Brighton resident, about 50% is paid to the municipality, about 38% uh, to the county, and about 12% to education. So that's the current uh, split between the, the three um, levels that appear on the, the, the tax bill. Uh, when we look at the services, you saw most of our services in the, in the presentation. Of course, they're, they're wide ranging. Um, the county provides you know, roads and bridges, all the capital and maintenance, social services, child care, um, housing, paramedics, long-term care, waste, ECDAV and tourism, and so on. Uh, we also have um, other um, charges that were mandated to pay, such as our contribution to the local health unit, to MPAC. So some of those things are, uh, I guess, levied on the county and we're, we're obligated to, to pay those share, that share. Um, we, uh, we don't uh, track our data to say, you know, how many EMS calls and how long did they take for uh, each member of the municipality. We, we don't capture, you know, how many residents living in, lo in long-term care are actually originally from uh, a municipality. Uh, we look at our services provided to the county in, in its entirety, and we ensure that those services are there when any resident in the county needs them. Um, it's not something where we track that information. Um, it, it's about making sure that the resident, the, the services are provided on the whole. Um, so you know, we can, can look at the allocations in, in how that assessment occurs, um, but we don't keep data um, specifically on what's reinvested um, as far as, um, you know, like I said, how many calls you're, you're getting through paramedics or um, how many clients you have uh, being, uh, being looked after through, through social services programming or assisted in some way. Uh, so, so that that data doesn't um, exist. However, in the next couple of questions that Glenn is going to answer, um, he will highlight some of the uh, infrastructure type projects um, where it's a little more obvious, and and you can see that something was constructed or built within the the boundaries of of the municipality. Uh, but again, um, that's the softer services. We we simply don't track it. It's it's about ensuring the services are there countywide. So, with that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, to Glenn to talk a little bit about. Um, some of the projects, um, and, and Glenn, you can, can speak to the next couple of questions. Okay, thank you. So yeah, the next um, couple of questions, the next two questions are, are, are fairly related, so I'll, I'll just group those um, together. Uh, the first one is, is what, what, what projects and programs are completed or underway within our municipality that is funded entirely through the county? And then the second question is, um, each year the county applies for grants and funding available through the provincial government. Are there any projects that are in the works or in the planning stage uh, through the county that are within the municipality of, of Brighton? So um, I'll touch on a, a couple of items, primarily looking at infrastructure firstly. Um, so from the perspective of, of pavement rehabilitation and preservation, uh, the, looking at the years 2019 to 2021, there were some fairly significant investments uh, in Brighton in respect to, to County Road 30 for approximately uh, 5.8 million and for County Road 2 for approximately 3.2 million. Um, to a lesser extent, there was more uh, minor works either completed or planned for on County Roads 26, 64 and 29, approximately 120,000 for culvert rehabilitation. And then looking uh, at safety improvements, um, County Road 64, the at grade uh, crossing safety improvements uh, for works over the years 2019 
to 2022, uh, totaling $2 million. Um, this is a project sourcing grants from the Transport Canada Rail Safety Improvement Program for approximately $1 million, 500,000 from the railways themselves, and 500,000 um, from the county. Um, further on, on County Road 64, uh, county and municipal staff are currently working together to develop a scope of work to retain a consultant to complete a planning and design for County Road 64 from Main Street in Brighton to the county boundary, including underground services. Um, construction timing will be determined through the design process and will be largely informed by timing of approvals from the Ministry for Water and Sewer and coordination and uh, approval from CNR and, and CPR. Uh, from the perspective of, of, of waste services, uh, there's been approximately $10 million in infrastructure investment at, at the Brighton landfill related to cell expansion, uh, historic waste relocation, and, and new, new cell construction and lining of cells over the past several years. Uh, also at Brighton landfill, a new organic waste transfer building for a million dollars, a new household hazardous waste building for 100 and upgrades to public uh, drop off areas. Uh, also from the, the perspective of, of Brighton Landfill, just to, just to provide uh, some, some context to a uh, county providing funding, funding to Brighton. Over the past five years, the county has paid uh, Brighton approximately 310,000 in host fees and grants in, in lieu of taxes related to uh, the Brighton Landfill location. For the county's social housing stock, through the Northumberland County Housing Corporation, approximately 130,000 over the last couple of years on capital. Uh, this is excluding the regular maintenance activities that we would see on our, on our housing stock. And looking at uh, soft services, a, a successful um, application with the, the Ministry of, of Education, sourcing approximately 520,000 in early years capital program funds to build an infant room addition for the Brighton uh, Children's Centre located in the Brighton Public School. Uh, this really, th this project is, is pending as, as the scope of project has changed and expanded. Uh, the county has committed uh, 350,000 from reserves and currently working with the Ministry of Education to source um, additional uh, funding. Uh, I should also mention that, that within our long-term plan, the county does uh, or has had in place for several years and still does continue to maintain a, a placeholder, ensuring that we have sufficient financing uh, for moving forward with a, a possible shared emergency services base, if, if that moves forward with, with Brighton, similar to what we've, we've seen uh, constructed in Cranny, all the way with Haldeman, and, and most recently um, Trent Hill. So currently this placeholder is, is, is for 1.1 million within the year um, 2023, uh, but obviously this, this is within our long-term model and, and the amount and, and the timing is always uh, subject to change, just like anything within the model, but important to note that it, it is it is a it is identified from that from that perspective. Okay. So the next question um, is also for me, uh, and this is related to the county payroll. And the question is, um, I would like to know the county payroll for the following: the number of employees and dollar amounts, both actual 2020 and budget for 2021, excluding the Golden Plow Lodge staff and paramedics. So the county employs 612 individuals, inclusive of full-time, part-time, casual, um, seasonal, and, and student. Uh, that includes 129 paramedics and 216 GPL staff. So excluding the paramedics and GPL, uh, the complement is 267. Uh, from a dollar perspective, the 2020 actual total um, wages and benefits, excluding the GPL and paramedics, was approximately 20.3 million. The 2021 budget total, excluding GPL and paramedics, uh, is, is 21.9 million. So it's, it's really important to note here that the, the 2020 actual wages and benefits at, at 20.3 million were significantly less than the 2020 budget of, of 21.4 million. Uh, and primarily this is because of wage gapping. And then there's a couple of reasons causing this. We typically do uh, experience wage gapping um, each year as a result of positions when they become uh, vacant, it, uh, dependent on the timing for when the positions are, are, are filled from um, staff turnover. We certainly saw that in 2020 and in light of the pandemic, 
uh, the, uh, those hirings were delayed to a, a longer um, extent than what we typically would have seen, which, was, which saw uh, increased gapping. Uh, but there was also um, savings realized uh, within wages and benefits with the closure of the Ontario Agri-Food Agri Venture Centre for a period of time as a result of the, the, the pandemic and the decision to not hire um, students in certain areas with, within 2020. So 2020 really does represent a, a bit of a, an anomaly when looking at, at actual wages. Uh, the 2021 budget at 21.9 million uh, also includes um, a new IT technical support uh, analyst uh, providing for expansion of shared services uh, with our our, our, our our member municipalities that participate in shared services for, for IT. So this really is a, a cost recovery position. It, it doesn't have impact on the levy. And typically we will see that in, in budget years where uh, you know we are perhaps adding staff from the perspective of the needs related to shared services and not having a, 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 an impact on the county levy or for areas where we also have um, provincial funding uh, which uh, requires um, staffing, staffing resources. So with that, we're at the last question and that one for Jennifer. Okay, and the final question was, uh, other than regular annual road maintenance, uh, what are some of the examples where the county partnered with the municipality of Brighton lately? Uh, so there, there's a bit of a list here. I'll, I'll go through them really quickly. Uh, of course, we typically, uh, we have not had to do it with COVID because we are, are getting our emergency response exercise in, uh, in real life, but uh, normally we would partner on those annual exercises. Uh, we have always partnered um, historically on the uh, mayors, keep your, um, mayors Keep the County Clean Challenge, uh, where we uh, uh, mobilize the community to uh, collect litter from roadside ditches. Uh, we uh, do partner, um, we, well, we, I guess we've been working on a partnership, um, it has not yet come to fruition, but um, we have had a number of preliminary discussions with the IT department um, to look at an, an opportunity. We do provide shared services to a number of, of other municipalities. Um, we uh, do uh, work together uh, for joint uh, municipal fire uh, dispatch services. That was uh, something that the county took over uh, a couple of years ago where we do one contract and we manage that contract administration on behalf of all of the member municipalities. Um, we do, uh, we, we have worked together with the cybersecurity and Brighton participated in the shared risk assessment exercise and uh, has that information. Historically, we have uh, partnered with surface treatment um, Brighton has opted out of that this year, but we have done that for many years in the past. Uh, the county does provide plumbing and septic in inspection services as a shared service. We, our paramedics, of course, uh, work closely with fire on our tiered response agreements and, and how we respond to medical calls. Uh, we are both partners of many intermunicipal inter working groups. The county manages the archive collection for the municipality. Um, I did mention earlier about the, um, the affordable housing strategy and um, the, the partnerships that are, are there to be developed. Uh, and as, as Glenn has mentioned, um, still looking at the possibility of a joint paramedic fire base um, in, in the future as another opportunity. Um, there's also uh, opportunities around additional shared services where we provide um, some of those services to a select group of member municipalities and the offer is always there uh, for any uh, member to participate if they, if they wish to do so. Uh, so with that, I think we have finally come to, to the end. <laughs> and I can assure you, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to bet you there's some more questions. So members of council, uh, we've, we've had the answers to your uh, pre-delivery questions. If there are any other questions you have of uh, the county CAO and treasurer, now is your opportunity. Um, let's not take up too much more time. We're already an hour into this meeting and we do have some business to take care of this evening. So Councillor Anderson, you have your hand up. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer and uh, your guests there, uh, thank you very much, both of you, for a great presentation. A lot of good information. I have only one question because for time reasons, uh, a lot of good questions you answered. Affordable housing is on the top of a lot of our, not just one person here, I think the entire council is uh, behind this affordable housing situation. You mentioned uh, like we were Oh, number four on the list uh, when when you did a study that for the area that needs affordable housing or the demand for affordable housing. Um, I don't know how you arrive at that, but uh, 
affordable housing, you talk about partnerships just at the end of your presentation and they're to be developed. Um, land you need and uh, if we could, so I'm, my understanding is if there is land and I don't know what process is being taking place now for to find those partners, but if the partners come together and the land comes together pretty quick, are you gonna be there for Brighton? Now, you mentioned Elgin Street being something that's going to be completed or will be where well, you're after that, you have nothing uh, on the books. So if we move quickly, can we be on the books? That, that is, is really uh, what, what we've said our position is, is that um, when we look at our lists, um, we, we look at the, how long the wait lists are and we know that all of our communities currently have wait lists. So, uh, and, and we know that we need to, to work in, in every community. Um, as I mentioned, there's two projects that are, are up in, uh, in Coburg because they've got about a 10 year wait list right now or a little more than that. Uh, but um, yes, we are certainly willing to, to work with Brighton. Uh, we would certainly, we'd need, as you mentioned, land is, is what the first thing we need is. Uh, and then there is a process and we're, now that we're getting into the development mode, we are learning. Uh, there are CMHC funding available to help um, seed funding to help do the development and we've been successful with that. Um, on our Elgin Street project. So that would be the route. Uh, and then we um, really what, what our strategy is, is that uh, we need the land, we need the seed funding to start the, the pre-development work. Uh, and then from there, we are in a position that we can start to apply for other funding opportunities that come up. I think um, obviously none of us have um, the, the money set aside that we can fund these types of projects on our own. Uh, but there are opportunities through funding and, and uh, debenture combinations uh, where we can fund more. So, but we need to get to the point of having shovel ready projects before we can be successful with those applications. So that's what we are, we are open to partners and in, in if Brighton um, has some opportunities and I think we can start to, to look and see um, if they fit the model um, for housing. We are looking at a slightly different model. We used to be exclusively rent geared to income, which then had a, a significant operating cost with funding that. That's what our existing buildings are. We're trying to look at our new models where there are affordable units as well as the RGI units so, so that there, um, there is um, the ability for that the project to be closer to revenue neutral, which doesn't require the ongoing uh, levy dollars to operate it. So those are the, some, some of the things that we're looking at, but the size and shapes of projects obviously uh, need to be unique to the community, but we are open to partnerships, uh, certainly. We could carry this on for a whole meeting, so I'll just leave it there though. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, CAO, for the answer. Councillor LeBlanc. I'll mute myself. Thank you very much for the, uh, the presentation, uh, CAO. Uh, I have a question on the bag tags because in the levy, when we uh, tax our, our residents on the, their properties, they pay for collection and disposal. So if I use your $4.25 for bag tag, basically on a tone, most garbage bags lay way less than 10 pounds. So you'd have 220 bags per tone which totals $938, remove your $130 tipping fee, it leaves $805. And they're paying more for disposal fees that are waste than the normal tipping fee at the landfill. And also with the, the uh, waste contract that was there when it was awarded, it also said that they would collect uh, garbage, they would have smaller garbage trucks that they would collect on unassumed roads. In Brighton, we have one, possibly a couple more assumed road that are being collected that I brought uh, to your to the attention of your staff, which they're looking at. But when I went into Crammy Township and I looked at McDonald Road, which has been unassumed, and they're getting garbage collection and they've been having it for the past three years, but Brighton isn't getting it. Then also when you look at expenditures at the landfill, your 10, your one and your 5 million, that's also taking advantage. The other six municipalities are also taking advantage of that cost. It's not specific to Brighton. Maybe the money, the money was spent, but it was also used by the rest. So my, my question is, it's gonna come back to the bag tag, is how come that the residents are paying $805 a ton more than the tipping fee of $130 a ton? And how much of the levy is for collection and disposal that uh, isn't, that I, it isn't shown here. 
but I think there's a couple questions there for you. Uh, so the, the bag tags um, do not cover the full cost of the collection contract. They, at, at one point they did, they don't today. Uh, so the, uh, the cost of that contract is funded through both the bag tag and the levy, it's a combination. Um, so the residents are paying for the service of the collection uh, and, and that's the bag tag is, is for that. The reason we split the cost of the service between a bag tag um, and, and, and the levy is, is as Glenn mentioned in, in his um, response to the one of the, the, the pre-submitted questions was that um, by having the bag tag, it's really meant to be an incentive for our residents to participate in the diversion program. It, it's about encouraging them that um, if you're able to use all of the recycling, the, the organics, you, um, you choose to, to reduce waste within your household, you can substantially reduce the amount of money that you would pay annually for bag tags. So you will still have a small a, a portion uh, through the levy, but the, the balance of the waste cost, you can control those because you're, you have good practices for waste management within your household. Uh, so that is why the, the funding is shared between the two. When you look at it on a, a per tone basis, we our residents are paying for the, the waste management service, which includes collection, not just the disposal. Um, residents can, can choose to pay the, the tipping fees and they can drive waste to the landfill themselves. We encourage them to use the service. Uh, it's going past their door and we pay on a per household um, stop a uh, rate. That's the way the contract is built. So um, by leaving it at the curb, that's, that's being paid for. Um, through those fees. So we encourage them to use that. Uh, also a little more green by not having everybody drive to the land, landfill individually um, and uh, a little more, more of, of efficient to, to do that. But um, they are able to, to use that on a, on a, a tonnage basis if they, if they want to drive trailer loads there. Um, but again, not, not encouraged because we want them to use the, the diver, diversion programs. And then the other question about uh, some of the unassumed roadways. Yeah. Uh, some somewhere somewhere historic in other municipalities and not in Brighton. And I'll let you carry on from there. Yeah. So some of that is um, in in the works, and um, so there there's a lot of history there that over time um, certain roadways were um, it was it was collected for one reason or another. Um, lots of things happened long before many of us were were part of of the program and, and managing it. Um, so as um, we're we're looking at that. Um, as roads come to our attention or they're brought to our attention, staff um, assess them to see what vehicles, what the condition of the road, it, to make sure that it's safe, um, where turnarounds would be, all of those, those sorts of things. Um, and when they meet all that criteria, um, then as that assessment's getting completed, they're working with um, the, the, the collection company to see if those roads are suitable and if they can begin collection. So um, that process is ongoing. Um, as we're assess as looking at those roads and, and assessing them. Um, the priority with getting the new collector on, on board uh, really was getting the, the Recycle Right program rolled out. And then uh, now we're getting into the phases where we're looking at some of those details like um, roads that would fit that criteria and fit our, our waste collection bylaw. And there are a couple of those roads in Brighton coming online uh, soon, I think. Yes. Yeah. Councilor Blanc, do you have a follow-up? Yes, but it has to do with uh, roads, uh, bridges. Okay, well, hang on, I want to see if anybody else has a question before we move on. Yeah. Any other members of council with a question? Councillor Tadden? Can you hear me now? Sure can. Okay, uh, just the one thing, Jennifer, and I don't know how involved the county is in it, but it seems to me that we did have a wrap. I was placed on a committee for transportation. It's very successful going east from Brighton uh, with the Quinney access, but I haven't heard anything about any movement. And there is people in Brighton who, who need that kind of transportation to go to Coburg Hospital, um, to doctors. Uh, I, my, I personally have a doctor in Coburg and I know a lot of other people that do. Then there's another doctor there that services Brighton patients but there's other um, reasons to go to to Port Hope Coburg well Grammy probably too so is there any movement on that uh it accessible transportation is is not um something that the county has had any significant involvement in 
Um, there is some funding that goes towards community care, um, which, which does make some uh, transportation available, uh, but we have not been involved in, in any direct delivery of that service or, or coordination. So uh, other than a mining, minor funding role, um, that's what we've done. And, and when you mentioned the, the medical needs, um, that, that's very much recognized across the medical community. And our role with the uh, Ontario Health Team Northumberland has actually identified that. And there's uh, the new clinic in Colburn that has rolled out to, to assist with some of the medical outreach and, and looking um, at uh, probably future um, clinics with a similar model um, so that we can get some more um, healthcare out into the rural areas, uh, as well as things like the uh, community paramedics and that. So healthcare is probably one of the highest concerns when we look at accessible transportation and getting folks moved into the more urban centers for appointments and that sort of thing. Um, so there, there's, we've been a little more involved in what we can do to provide some services out into the, the community, um, but not directly involved in, in the transportation side of it. Can I follow up just on yes, that? You can. Yep, yeah, um, because I sit on the Quinny Access and have for some time, they have established uh, um, Quinny West uh, a transit uh, ridership that has been very successful. And of course, the gas tax really helps uh, to fund that. So, wouldn't that be something that um, uh, the whole of, of the county would be interested in in getting going so that we do have that kind of service. And it's not just for people for doctor's appointments, it's for people getting to work and schools and all the, all the other things that people like to use transit for. So you still would not be involved in that, Jennifer? I think it's certainly an, a collaboration opportunity with all of our member municipalities. Um, we, we don't have access to provincial gas tax money because we're not a transit provider. Right. Um, so it would, it would be something that uh, we could certainly um, see all our member municipalities collaborate and, and the county might be able to, to play a role in assisting with the collaboration. But um, no, we don't receive the funding to be, to be directly involved, uh, which Quinty would- No, I knew that, yeah. And that, but that, 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 my recollection, Councillor Feynman, is that collaboration is done with Community Care Northumberland, which is where that transportation committee came up. Um, came up. So maybe I'm wondering if their committees just haven't been meeting through the pandemic, and that's why you haven't heard from them. So perhaps uh, Tr Trish well, Barron might be your contact there. Mayor, uh, the chair of the committee for some reason quit, and then there's been no contact whatsoever for about two and a half, three years. Interesting. Okay. I made a little note here. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Tadman. Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Jennifer and uh, Glenn for answering uh, some, some of my questions. Uh, Jennifer, just one question, um, and it has to do with um, the, uh, the partnerships with the, with the county housing that you're speaking about, the Alvin Street Project and the Ontario Street Project. Um, you mentioned the Ontario Street Project has two or three um, partners. Does the city of Coburg is there any um, partnership from them involved in that, as well as with the Elgin Street? I know when you speak with, um, when you talked earlier, as far as uh, with Brighton, Brighton could maybe supply some land and we could work something out. Um, are these lands uh, at Elgin and Ontario, were they provided by the city of Coburg or are these lands that the county already own? Thank you. The Elgin Street property is actually uh, land that is currently owned by the, the county's housing corporation. Uh, and we currently have townhouse units on there and those, those units will uh, be uh, demolished and we will be putting up uh, apartment style, um, kind of a unique sort of a, a design build because of the, the sizes of the units. So it, it's, it's land that, that we've had for quite some time and we'll be removing existing units to put new units uh, in its place. Uh, the Ontario Street property um, is land um, that the county purchased uh, and with the partnership that we have with uh, Habitat and, uh, and uh, Aboriginal Housing is that um, they will come to the table and it will be a third, a third, a third is what we will look at uh, for funding that go forward. So the town is not a, a direct partner in, in either one of those. Um, they have been more of an indirect partner to look at um, 
how they can assist us with moving the projects forward from a planning and development um, type of, of perspective. Um, we, uh, we will most likely be approaching them to see if there's um, participation that they can do in whether they would waive um, anything um, fee related, that sort of thing. Um, those, those asks may come, may come to be um, for, for that partnership. So at this point in time, um, Coburg has not directly partnered. May I ask one follow up on that, please? Okay. Okay. Um, just that you said you purchased, and I'm not looking for who you purchased from, but would you have purchased that property from the city of Coburg? That was or, no, or private. Yeah, no, we, we purchased that land from a private landowner. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bateman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. If I can go back to the, uh, the affordable housing, because I think it's, I'm passionate about it, and I think all the other councillors are as well. And where you placed us on the list, uh, I think you said third or fourth. And it's more of a commentary because, and I'm thrilled to hear that you said in your uh, talk that you would partner with the municipality we found available land. Because when I look at your numbers on your website, I would say that Brighton is near the top of the list because if you average out your wait times for the ones that are at the top of the list, they actually fall below the wait time for our municipality. Our municipality only has one bedrooms listed as a six year wait. We have no two, three or four. So we are actually probably close to number two on that list when you look at averaging out with the other. So it is something that's extremely important in Brighton. I know it is in other areas, but based on the statistics, it's, it's, it's near the top. The only other comment I had from some residents that uh, had sent me some stuff last week and I looked on the website and this is more of a comment when I look at the strategic plan for the county. And I think it goes out to 2023 on uh, housing. It talks about quarterly updates and uh, I couldn't find them in Norfolk the residents on the uh, quarterly updates for the housing as it calls out in the strategic plan. So I don't know if they're there and we just were looking in the wrong spot or if they haven't been updated or not due to the pandemic or whatever the case may be. Um, with respect to, to the, um, the updates, um, we can follow up uh, in making our website um, compliant with the new accessibility standards. Uh, quite a bit of material has been removed and is now available upon request um, because we didn't um, go through the, the, uh, the expense and, and the effort of making it all historical documents compliant. So um, if there's um, a, a time period or certain documents that you're looking for, we, we can can pull those out and, and, and provide them to you um, on, on request. But we, we did have to remove a lot from our website at the end of the year to make sure that we were now compliant with the accessibility standards. Yeah, I, I think it was just the, the, the residents that reached out, they were looking for the update on the strategic plan as to pertain to the affordable housing. They could not find it on the website, nor could I. And did you want to make comment on uh, being number four on the list? I don't think I don't think we meant that Brighton was number four on the list, but that we were on the waiting list side, number four in the ranking. Yes, it it is calculated based on the wait time um, to to get into the units. is is really how housing um, determines how they would look at it, and they look at the estimated um, time until like, at the units would become available for those on the list. So. Um, Brighton, I think the number was about 190 households that are are waiting in Brighton, um, and that's estimated to be about a six-year wait list. Um, when they do that calculation for uh, the other municipalities, um, it is it is longer. Um, I know Coburg's a little over 10 years at this point. Um, the others fall fall somewhere in between. It, it's really, um, I guess, in in some ways, the, the numbers really don't don't mean a lot at this point. We know that everybody needs more affordable housing, um, and, and it's not. You know who has the longest wait list um if you're in need of housing it doesn't matter if it's six years or ten years that's a long time um so it's every, everybody needs it we know all of our communities can use more more affordable housing did you have a follow-up council Bateman? uh just a quick follow-up so when i look at the the list because all the municipalities uh, with the exception of colburn cranny brighton warkworth it it shows one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom. So is there none of those available in our municipality or is the wait list, uh, what, what would be the wait list on a two bedroom, three bedroom and four bedroom in our municipality? Cause it's um, not. I, I don't believe that there are any units. Um, I believe all of the units that we own that are, are, one? Brighton are one bedroom okay. um, at this point in time. 
Uh, okay. And that goes back to the historical. That's what was downloaded from the province and the, the housing portfolio they had, uh, I guess, about 2001 when that download occurred. There has not been any new construction or additions to the portfolio um, since that time. So the projects we're looking at now are the first builds that will happen from the, the housing corporation um, since the provincial download. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you both, Deputy Mayor Vink. My question see, is, go ahead. I, you, you, we couldn't hear you there, so go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So my question is around uh, affordable housing as well. Um, you mentioned that there is no available land, um, but you also mentioned that it's Northumberland County that owns the land that you're currently building on in Coburg. And I'm wondering if it's up to the municipality to find land or whether it's up to the, the county to find the land. Just so we're clear on what the process is. And uh, obviously we all would like something here and we would like to make sure that we're doing the right thing to make that happen. Um, but I think we need clarity on, on whose job it is to find and purchase the land. I don't think it's a question of whose, whose job it is. Um, it's that um, we're at a point in time where um, we've looked at opportunities going forward. Um, so in, in Coburg, um, like I said, one is, is rebuilding on land we already own. So obviously that wasn't a question of acquisition. Um, the other piece of land and opportunity um, came up and, and we did decide to use some reserves to acquire that land so that we would um, have something um, in, in reserve for, for future builds. Uh, we do not have any other land in our land bank. Um, so I think what, what we really said we need to do is an approach as we need some help with eyes and ears around the county. Uh, member municipalities are closer to what's available. Um, they know what's going on in their communities. They know when there's land available. Um, and we could use their support and assistance in finding good locations um, and finding appropriate land that's available. We know that some of our member municipalities do have land that they're currently not using. Um, and if they want to work with us to identify that and, and look at uh, an opportunity to, to put housing on those properties. And not all municipalities have that, but we know some do. Uh, and there could be opportunities there with lands that they own that would be very suitable to housing. So um, it, it needs to be a partnership and it needs to be a collaboration because um, everybody has different, different knowledge of their community uh, and our preference is that we can work together to find locations that, that work for, for both um, the member municipality and the county. Uh, and then I think it's being creative and we look at partnerships the partnership we're doing for Ontario Street is something that we have not tried before. It's looking at nonprofit partners and the Aboriginal Housing Group. Um, so again, that's looking at ways that we can um, bring other funding to the table and it provides value for everybody. So that's what we also want to explore with member municipalities. Is there a way that we can accelerate um, getting housing into more communities uh, if we're a bit creative in how we do that? And, and that's what we're saying. Bring us ideas. We want to work with everybody. Um, it, it's not just us waiting for, for an opportunity and then coming in and saying, this is what we're going to do. Uh, I think we want everybody to, to work with us on this. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor LeBlanc for your question on road. Thanks, Roman. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for all uh, my council, the other councillors for talking about affordable housing. Really, really learned a lot from it. Uh, to me on roads, I'm going to go to Loomis Bridge which is a bridge that was basically, they had, the county had public meetings, agreed to fix the bridge with the residents, and now it's closed. I was wondering if there's anything in the future for Loomis Bridge to reopen it, or to, what they're, what they're planning on doing with it. Leave it closed or open it? Uh, at this point in time, there isn't any um, a specific plan. Um, it is um, at the, at its current state of being closed for, for now. Um, uh, we have um, started some uh, very early conversations at the staff level um, to look at what um, we think at a staff level, level would be um, the most uh, appropriate uh, course of action moving forward uh, and, and to see um, if, it, if it makes sense to, to reopen that EA um, and, and um, it, you know, is, is, does the, the original um, decision of the EA still make sense um, now that it's been closed for a while? Um, or um, should we look at other alternatives 
And when we look at um, our infrastructure dollars uh, and the needs of the community, um, I, I think there, there maybe needs to be another look and, and, and decide um, jointly uh, what the best approach is and the best way that we can spend it for infrastructure dollars, whether they're at the county level or at the member municipal level, um, we need to decide how we can set, spend that, that smartly. So we've started early conversations, but there is, has been anything um, decided about where we're, where we're gonna go next yet. Still very early on. Thank like you when you that. said joint before you go on I, I trust that those conversations are also being had uh, at the local level uh, for infrastructure opportunities shall we say and I, I i see mr castleman making notes so that's good too council blanc back to you i just like when she said jointly that really <laughs> that made me happy that we're working jointly to get it done you thank you Mayor. thank you councillor tadman thank you mayor um uh, jennifer does age count when we're looking for uh, social housing? Because I, I got to believe that uh, the Francis Court buildings have to be 40 years old anyways. I remember visiting people in the 80s there. And I know Mead Street was there long before that. So if, if for no other reason, I think it's time that the county looked at Brighton again because we've grown an awful lot uh, during all those years and uh, we have that many more people that need the help with social housing. So I, I can't possibly think that, uh, that all of the other municipalities represented in the county have the uh, that it, that age of, of social housing maybe i'm incorrect in that but it seems an awful long time that we've even had a look at for brighton for social housing um age counts i guess both uh, with the building and with the tenants um we know that um, when we look at funding opportunities there are uh, priorities and seniors uh, continue to be a priority group if we're looking at, at who we're serving with with buildings uh, the age of the buildings, of course, is important, and we actually uh, we were supposed to do it last year, but we got delayed because we couldn't send folks into our buildings. But we are doing uh, an assessment of all of our housing infrastructure um, to get recommendations on what uh, investments are required to either maintain that property um, in its current state, or is it to a point where we should be doing other things? And that's exactly why we're redeveloping the Elgin Street property is because um, those buildings were of an age and of a, con of a condition. Um, as well as their design, that it was not the best use of that infrastructure uh, to keep putting money into it. Also, because of the townhouse style, it was not the best use of the land available and how we could best serve and, and get, like I said, we're going from 18 units to 40 units. So um, we could get a lot more to maximize the use of that land. Um, so we're in the process of going through similar condition assessments for all of our housing stock um, so that we'll um, have a better sense of whether we should be continuing to invest in our buildings or if it's time that they be rebuilt um, and if they're rebuilt, uh, what do they look like? So it doesn't mean they'll all be rebuilt, um, but that assessment is underway to, to get that information at hand as we decide uh, what we need to do with our stock going forward. Thank you for that. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor Tadman? Yes, it just that uh, because I've heard now for a few years that there's problems at the Francis Court and especially um, some some residents have actually even died and not got the help that they needed there there's a there's a certain percentage of of the tenants there who are quite nervous with some of the other people that are in the building uh, who would look after that kind of a complaint because it's been sent to the county many times and and nothing seems to get done at least uh, maybe the locks could be changed and more secure so that people aren't wandering around night and day in in that building because it's supposed to be a secure building correct it should be controlled access um there there is uh there's the housing manager would be the the best spot um the complaint there is a complaint process if residents have issues um and and i i am aware of, of that process um being shared so that the, the residents that have concerns um, should, should be familiar with that process. Um, there are uh, housing caseworkers that can support and assist residents as well. Um, and they know, know the process um, that if there's a concern, um, it can be um, 
I guess a um, a challenging issue with with um, some tenants. Um, of course, there's a quite a diverse group of folks living living in our, our in our buildings, and um, many of those folks do require um, supports. Um, so we we do our best to to provide those. But the the housing um, department, so the, the manager and her staff, um, do take action. They any complaints that can come in are investigated, um, but they they have to have the, the details from. Um, those that are making the complaints, so they they know what they're what they're looking into and following up on. Okay, thanks. Thank you both. Any further follow up questions, Councillor Anderson? Thank you. Uh, the provincial government and the federal government, where are they play in any of this? Uh, they talk about it, but I don't haven't heard anything tonight regarding where they might be and supporting what we're after it's not and it's not just our community it's every community but it, it sounds after talk listening to a couple of counselors here uh we've moved we should be at number one now <laughs> after <laughs> really uh counselor bateman made some good statistics there and uh counselor T uh, tadman got some those are aging buildings and uh and uh I think if somebody really has it, it's time to move us now because nothing's going to happen. Even if we all could get the shovels out tonight, you're not going to see anything there for two, three, long, three, four years. So I think it's time that we really focus on it. We need to talk to our our uh, members of parliament, our members of government, to see where they are with it because it's it's sort of a mandate that they're probably shying away from uh this year because they have so many other concerns but it's uh it's coming this our community is growing to the point we need to be uh, be a little more proactive in this area and uh, i know we've ta everybody's talked about it we're not the first council probably to talk about it but i think this will be the council that's going to do something about it so that's my point I, I will say that for the Elgin Park project, we do have support from uh, the, the other orders of government. Um, they have come to the table with funding for that project. Uh, really what we've seen is that we need to get to the point of a, a shovel ready, tangible project, uh, and then we can um, make application for the actual funding for construction. Um, so, so that's where I think locally, um, we need to do a bit of work so that we we know what we're presenting, uh, which is what we were able to do with Elgin Park. That um, we actually um, we we did have a, a project that was had a, a good shape to it. We um, we knew what it was going to going to look like roughly, um, and we were able to put that in front of our provincial uh, counterparts, and um, they they ran with it, and we we had a funding announcement uh, back in the summer, so that we we do have a significant portion of funding available. So, but we we do have to get to a shovel ready state before we're going to see them come to the table. I think. Okay. Well, let's do it. Okay. Councillor Bradley, I saw your hand up. Do you still have a question? I do, but it's uh, running late, so maybe I will just uh, send an email, Jennifer. It has to do with roads, so I will do that, and then maybe uh, once you answer, you could copy all of council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rowley, for that, and thank you both for sh joining us. Um, sometimes Brayton feels like the Alberta of Northumberland County, and <laughs> maybe you got that that uh, idea that uh, we could um, we would really appreciate. Uh, not a, not a good not a good look, but a good investment in the community. Certainly, we we do appreciate what's happening over at the uh, at the Children's Center and what's going to be happening uh, along Prince Edward Street and at the railroad tracks. Uh, that's going to be a huge investment. But uh, I think our staff and county staff um, could do could do some work in terms of talking about infrastructure and uh, maybe some horse trading and and what we can do to to get some things done uh, for both both levels of government here. So thank you both very much for coming, for answering all those questions and for giving us your presentation. It's appreciated. And with that, uh, members of council, I have a motion that will read that council receives a presentation from Jennifer Moore, CAO, Glenn Dees, Treasurer, Northumberland County regarding the 2021 county budget uh, and other things, but we'll just leave it at county budget. Could I have a mover, please? Council Rowley, seconder. Councilor Bateman. Are there any further questions on the motion? There being none, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. 
Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rally? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Sorry, Laura, didn't hear you. I saw her lips say yes. Okay. <laughs> Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And that's carried. Thank you. Thank you both again very much. Have a pleasant what's left of your night. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Our next delegation uh, is the Minister of Transportation Project team. So I have a Mr. Gox and a Mr. Wasim. Uh, gentlemen, there you are. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so I'll turn the floor over to both of you uh, to introduce yourself and to carry on your presentation. Thank you, everybody. Um, Brent, is Brent uh, there? I, uh, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, okay. So, um, Brent, are you going to share your screen? I will do that right now. Please. Yep. Thank you. Yep. I can can see your screen here. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, I'm Mohammed Vasim, and um, I'm senior project engineer with MTO. And I would like to thank the municipality of uh, Brighton for the opportunity for the council presentation uh, for Highway 401 preliminary design and e environmental assessment study for the replacement of bridges and culverts uh, from Colborne to Brighton. Um, next slide, please, uh, Brent. So in today's um, presentation, we'll speak about the objectives of the study and uh, um, challenges and opportunities. Uh, we'll also talk about Highway 401, uh, future footprint uh, for interim six and ultimate eight lanes. Um, and we'll explain that why we need to establish the footprint for future six and eight lanes. Uh, followed by some bridge replacement alternatives uh, along with Highway 401 detours and potential property impacts followed by the project schedule and next steps. Um, in terms of challenges and opportunities, um, so this study is basically uh, looking into the long-term replacement needs uh, for the aging bridges and culverts uh, the bridges and culverts were, were built in, in late 50s. They are getting old and they are at a point uh, where they need to be replaced. Uh, so this study will allow us uh, to develop a preliminary design uh, for the replacement of bridges and culverts. Also as part of this study, uh, we are establishing the footprint of future six and eight lanes uh, to see where the future 401 alignment is going to land um, so that we can design the bridges and culverts appropriately and intelligently construct them at a proper and final location. And the new structures, uh, I mean, the new bridges and culverts uh, will be built long enough to accommodate future uh, footprint of the, of the 401. Uh, furthermore, this study will allow us uh, to overcome the rehab, uh, rehabilitation challenges uh, that the ministry is currently facing due to the uh, narrow highway platform during construction activities. Um, so this study will allow us to develop uh, appropriate rehab and replacement strategies to maintain the safe operation of Highway 401 corridor um, during construction, as well as for the current and future uh, planning horizons. Um, so this was uh, just a brief uh, kind of uh, objective of the study. And with this, um, I would uh, hand it over to my colleague, Brent Gartz, for, for the rest of the presentation. Uh, Brent? Thanks, Mohammed. I know I'm on the clock here and you've had a long night, so I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as I can. Uh, we are going to be doing a preliminary design and class environmental assessment study for Highway 401. As Mohammed mentioned, we'll be replacing all of the bridges and structural culverts that are in the study area and establishing a footprint for six lanes and ultimately eight lanes on the 401. We will also be upgrading the commuter parking lot at County Road 30. Uh, and in terms of study limits, 
we'll go from just east of Percy Street to just west of County Road 30, and then from just east of County Road 30 to uh, the Quinty West boundary, just west of Christiani Road. Why are we not doing the County Road 30 interchange in the area around that? Well, that's because that was an environmental assessment that was completed in roughly 2005. So there isn't really a need to revisit that. We are doing the carpool lot in that area, uh, but we won't be looking at the interchange itself. So just to put some locations to that, there are three bridges in the study area. Those are the red boxes. There is Hurley Road and Lake Road in Cranny and County Road 26 in Brighton. The four structural culverts are all just east of Little Lake. They're all kind of clustered together in these blue circles. And here's the carpool lot at County Road 30 that we'll be looking to improve. Um, as we move through the project, we'll be developing alternatives and identifying a preferred plan, and we'll be present, presenting that at a couple of milestones throughout the project. So as part of our work, we'll be doing a lot of engineering and environmental studies. Uh, here's a list of a couple of them. I'm not going to go through them exhaustively, but we'll be doing cultural heritage and archaeological assessments, fisheries and terrestrial impact assessments, groundwater and stormwater management plans, contamination overview study, air quality uh, assessments, noise assessments, erosion and sediment control overview risk assessment. That's an important one because some of the soils in the study area are quite prone to erosion, partly because there are drumlins around. Um, so that's something that takes on a bit more importance in this particular study. There are many more reports that we're going to be doing, but I, I don't want to bore you with a long list of things. Um, now, on the 401, we're looking at establishing, as Mohammed said, the six lane and, and eight lane footprints. There are two different flavors to the 401 in the study area. One is what we call a closed median, and that's where you've got this concrete, mar uh, concrete barrier down the median, uh, and everything's fairly tight together. In these areas, typically we end up widening to the outside because there isn't any room in the median to widen. And there are some other, and, and all those areas with closed median are shown in orange on the plan. The areas in purple, well, those are open median, and we've got about a 30 meter median through here. So this presents a little bit of an opportunity for us in that we can widen potentially to the inside and to the outside or one or the other. It gives us a little more room to work with. Uh, we'll have a few different alternatives that, that, um, that are variations on those themes of going inside and outside in terms of the, of the widening. So I'm going to go through quickly some of the crossing roads. These ones are in Crammy, so I'll go through them pretty quickly. The first is Hurley Road. Uh, to replace the bridge, we can either go to the west and build a new bridge. Uh, we'll construct that bridge while we maintain traffic on the existing road, and then we'll demolish the existing bridge. We can do the same thing to the east of the existing bridge, um, or we can close Hurley Road during construction. That allows us to keep Hurley Road on its existing alignment. So there are fewer property impacts. It's cheaper, it's easier to build, uh, but there is a detour that's required during construction. And we've carried those three alternatives forward. At Lake Road, it's a little trickier uh, because of the skew of the, of the bridge over the highway and the curvature of the highway. And because Crandall Road is so close and McDonald Road is so close, we looked at similar options of, of replacing to the west and to the east and closing the road temporarily and building it on its existing alignment. We did some analysis on that and we've really um, carried forward the, the third option, which is to close that road temporarily uh, and detour it during construction. That allows us to minimize property impacts and gives us a bit more uh, room to work with on the 401, depending on how we end up uh, identifying those six and eight lane footprints. And I'll add that these are all things that, that we're going to present at our first public information center, which is happening later this month. So there's still room for discussion on some of these uh, alternatives and we haven't selected one in most cases. Uh, at County Road 26, which is of course in Brighton, uh, this one's a little more complicated in, in some ways, uh, partly because the telephone road intersection is so very close uh, to Highway 401 and to the bridge. So we've got this colorful spaghetti here of different alternatives that we've considered. And you can see they really vary quite a bit in terms of their footprint impacts and how much property they'll require. Um, one of the things that may happen depending on a given alternative is a need to realign telephone road, which carries its own set of impacts to residential properties, to woodlands, 
uh, and it has cost implications as well. So that's our long list of alternatives. We do have a short list of alternatives that we'd like to present. Um, one is to realign County Road 26 to the west. That allows us to keep County Road 26 open fully during construction. Uh, but as you can see, it, it comes with it quite a few property impacts and environmental impacts um, to get that benefit of, of keeping both lanes of traffic moving. Oops. Um, the second alternative that we've carried forward is to close County Road 6 during construction. So there would need to be a detour via County Road 30 and County Road 41 to get to County Road 26. Um, this is the cheapest and the easiest to build. It has the fewest property impacts. Um, so that's why we've carried it forward. Uh, alternative seven looks very much the same as alternative six. And what this means is we would demolish half of the existing bridge, build half of the new bridge, put, put single lane traffic on the new bridge, demolish the other half of the existing bridge, and then build the second half. Of, uh, of the new bridge. So that's somewhere between these two. It means we can keep traffic moving, but only one lane at a time, which was similar to what was done for the most recent rehabilitation for that project. But it helps us to minimize some of those property impacts associated with realigning County Road 26 and, and also to Telephone Road. So this is something that we're still looking at. We've carried all of these uh, alternatives forward, and we're going to be developing these in a little more detail and performing some uh, more detailed evaluation on these. So I'd like to talk about bridge demolitions on Highway 401, um, the Hurley Road, Lake Road, and County Road 30. Well, I guess this, this slide is for Hurley Road and Lake Road. Um, we can't keep traffic moving on the 401 when we demolish these bridges. So we need to do something with the traffic while we demolish them. We're looking at, uh, as you can see here, 12 to 18 hour closures of Highway 401 or detours of Highway 401 onto the municipal road network. Um, we looked at possibilities to keep traffic moving within the right of way and really it's not possible because of the bridge type there. Um, we understand that that's an impact to the municipal road network. We would typically do this uh, off season, probably in the fall, not in the, the heart of the summer traffic season. We would typically do this on a Saturday evening and in overnight Saturday and into Sunday. Uh, we would provide police assisted traffic control to make sure everybody's going where they're supposed to go and they're not getting onto some of the more minor municipal roads and becoming a nuisance in that regard. So um, now there may, depending on how we construct these new bridges, there may need to be one closure or two and um, there may be some closures required shorter term for uh, bridge construction for girder erection and things like that. So um, that, that detour applies for both Hurley and Lake Road. Um, at County Road 26 to demolish that structure, we'd be looking to detour up uh, using the emerg emergency detour route um, up County Road 30 across 41 and, and down 40. Uh, similar to the previous demolitions, we'd be talking about a 12 to hour, uh, 12 to 18 hour closure of 401. Uh, and we would do that as off peak as possible and, and provide police for uh, traffic control. Um, so I'm gonna keep moving. Uh, in terms of property impacts, we do expect that there will be some property impacts along the 401 corridor, and that's due to identifying those six and eight lane footprints. There may be some property impacts associated with the bridge replacements, and you saw on the previous slides that there are some different flavors to those alternatives, so some may have very few impacts and some may have more. Um, having said that, we'll be presenting our short list of alternatives uh, later this month at our first public information center, or PIC, and we'll be presenting the final design at PIC2 later this year. But in between those two public information centers, we, were, we are going to be notifying property owners that we think are likely to be impacted and give them an opportunity to be informed before we present the final design. It gives us an opportunity to understand the impacts. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to consider mitigations and it lets them be informed a little bit sooner. So that's the plan for notifying impacted property owners. Um, we will be taking in, into account the comments that we receive and we'll refine where we can. Sometimes we can uh, ref, uh, minimize property impacts through design. Sometimes it's a little more challenging. 
So in terms of next steps, we'll be having our first public information center on April 21st. Because of COVID, this is going to be an online event. Uh, really, it's going to be a narrated video that we'll be presenting that presents the, the display materials. So we expect to get some comments and questions uh, uh, after that uh, public information center. And that'll be the first thing that we do afterwards is we'll review those and respond to them. Uh, we'll, we'll go on to refine our alternatives um, to a higher level of detail. We'll take into account the input that we get from the public and agencies. We'll be holding another municipal advisory committee meeting uh, in the summer. Uh, that is to present information, exchange information with municipal staff. We had a, a first one of these uh, a few months ago, and that was very useful to us to get information from, from Brighton staff and others. Um, as I mentioned before, we'll have some uh, targeted meetings with impacted property owners between the two PICs, and we'll have that second and final PIC in the fall of later this year. Uh, the final deliverable we have is a Transportation Environmental Study Report, or TESSER, and we expect to file that early next year, and that will be for 30 days of public review. Uh, we do have a project website you can see at the bottom that's got a little bit more information on it uh, but i suspect i'm out of time so uh, i will say thank you and i suspect there are some questions out there thank you very much i will uh turn the floor over to members of council i'll get you to stop sharing your screen brent if you don't mind so sure there we go. Perfect. thank you appreciate that um my quick question is uh, sort of a, a, a very long term uh, view, and that is, at what point do we whisper in your ear about a potential interchange uh, off of the 401 or onto the 401 uh, at County Road 26? Obviously not for this project, it, like I said, long term view, but is that something we should be talking about or, or mentioning now? Uh. Hello, I, I can address that question. So, um, uh, to be honest with you, this is the first time I'm 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 hearing about this uh, uh, this potential uh, proposal. Um, I am not sure at the top of my head that the that the traffic volumes here, uh, uh, if the traffic volumes aren't uh, an interchange here, but I can certainly. Uh, uh, note your comment and forward it to our our traffic office uh, uh, to look into it. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure you'll find we don't have the traffic volumes at the moment. I just, it's something we need to bookmark except for a conversation at some point. And uh, Randy, could I get you to mute everyone and then we'll unmute as we need to? And, and sorry. Mohammed, you just got muted. Oh, sorry. So, uh, can I speak? Okay, so the other thing I would like to mention that County Road 26 and 30, they are in very close proximity um, to each other. Um, so I guess uh, this factor uh, need to be considered as well um, in this, uh, in this, uh, um, potential uh, proposal. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Uh, Councilor LeBlanc, you had your hand up. Yes. When you do your, your road uh, impact study, are you looking at for excess fill? Because uh, on this part of the 401, it's quite accident prone. So you have a lot of hydrocarbons, you normally your normal SIR uh, salt impacted soils and a lot of them are moved are you going to be reusing it a lot on site or are you going to be doing your own fill site or looking for one uh, yeah no that's a very good question uh brent were you were you going to answer that no no go ahead okay. yeah so so basically as brent said um apart from the contamination uh the soil here in this area is is highly erodible uh so we we would be very careful in in, in kind of uh, using it, we'll see, we, we're gonna do further uh, soil investigations and boreholes during detailed design um, to look for both for the contamination and the erodibility perspective as well. If the soil is reusable, um, our preference gonna be to use it, 
But if it's not use, reuse, reusable, then it would be kind of disposed of to some kind of designated site, uh, which would be, I guess, Brent would be, we, we'll try to, um, uh, you know, look for those sites uh, as a part of this study, if we can, uh, where we can dispose it of. I believe we'll be doing an earth management plan as part of this study, and it's it's pretty preliminary. That type of work typically gets finalized in detail design, uh, but it would, at a high level, take a look at how much excess soil we have, if any, uh, what type of soil it is, and, and whether it might need to go to a special landfill or whether it might be managed um, closer to, to where it's excavated. Thank you, gentlemen. Councilor Bateman? You're muted, you're, you're muted, Mark. Sorry, uh, you might be able to answer this one for me, Mayor or Muhammad. The uh, PIC for April 21st, will that be put out somewhere for our residents, perhaps on our website and stuff, or is that something Muhammad and his team will promote that so that people can be aware that, because that's coming up rather quickly. That's a good question. Um, so um, if, I mean, it's, it's possible that if we can provide the project website and uh, municipality of Brighton can upload it on on their website so that public can uh, have access to it. So that could be a solution. Perfect, thank you. Cool. And if I could, Mayor, a quick follow up. Uh, just on the expansion, you mentioned uh, revamping the carpool lots, and you mentioned in particular the one on uh, thirty. And I know this is down the road somewhere, but with the expansion and it's much needed, anybody that's seen holiday traffic bottleneck in there, but with the expansion of uh, and the revamping of the parking lot and with the progression to EV vehicles, is there gonna be a model for the expansion of these parking lots along the four one quarter and particularly in ours, where you'd have a section set aside for down the road EV charging station? Cause that is, you know, as we're thinking down the road, there could be even more and more of those on the road. Uh, I would say it's not something specifically that we're looking at, um, but it's certainly not something that we preclude um, with this design. I, we hear that question uh, more and more. So I think, you know, the, the further into the future that these carpool lots get built, the more likely it is going to be built with those in mind. But I don't think there's anything in our design that would preclude it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Castleman, Mr. Hagerman. You heard the uh, comment about getting the information out on our website and through our social media channels for the PIC. On April 21st, please. Thank you. Any other questions from members of council? Councillor Anderson. Uh, two questions. Uh, with us reconstructing uh, Telephone Road from Highway 30 to 26 in the next year or whatever, well, how will that play into what time frame uh, you're going to be encroaching some of that? that road, it sounds with the extra, especially with you go to eight lanes, uh, there could be some concerns. And by moving the bridge to the west, it will also probably have some factors. So if we just, if we redo that road, how will that be impacted? And I have one other question after that, if you can answer that first. I, I don't think there's any indication that we would physically impact telephone road as a result of any 401 improvements. Um, you're, you're correct that we have alternatives on the table at the County Road 26 underpass that, that could require some realignment of the, of what would be the easternmost part of that uh, bit of telephone road. Uh, that's to be confirmed. But it wouldn't be uh, very major. It doesn't sound, but I'm just, I just bring it up. And then the car park at the, on Highway 30, it presently on the north side of the road, your, your color, color scheme shows more color on the south side of uh, Telephone Road. Is that just uh, a print thing or that I open think. space, that open space there, everybody's parking in there now anyhow. You may be giving our graphics a little more credit than they deserve. Uh, there's a pretty good sized piece of MTO property that surrounds the lot today. So we expect that that can be expanded within the existing uh, MTO property all on the, the north part of the road there. Okay. And just for clarification. Just for clarification, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Any other questions from members of council? 
Gentlemen, thank you very much for providing this update. Uh, good luck with your public information center on the 21st of April. Um, there may be some um, very interested people or maybe no one, no one will show. We'll <laughs> to see how that works out. And with that, uh, I have a motion that will read that council received the presentation from the Ministry of Transportation project team regarding the 401 planning study from Colburn to Brighton preliminary design and class EA study. Is there a mover? Councilor Bateman, seconder, Deputy Mayor Vink. Any further discussion? There being none, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? You're muted, Mary. Yeah. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? She said yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. Carried. Thank you. And Madam Clerk, are you aware of anyone joining? Sorry, gentlemen, thank you very much again for presenting to Brighton Council. It is appreciated and we look forward to hearing from you as this Thanks project moves for. forward. Thanks Thank for you having us. Thank you. Have a good night. Madam Clerk, uh, are you aware of anyone joining us for citizens comment or have you heard anything from the citizenry? I haven't seen any um, emails come through yet. Thank you. And with that, we move into staff reports. The first report is with regard to a fire grant. Uh, Chief Smith, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? No, sir. Thank you. The motion reads the council received the training funding report from Fire Chief Jim Smith and approves the expenditure for increased training opportunities and the establishment of a virtual inspection program of up to $7,500. Remover, Councilor Rowley, seconder, Councilor Bateman. Any questions or comments, members of council? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Sorry, Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And that's carried. Thank you. Our next report is with regard to site plan control application. Where is it now? Sorry, lost it. Number SP06 2020 Pro Excavating. And uh, Mr. Walsh, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight with my uh, with my kudos on your background? Mm -hmm. uh, no, Mayor, nothing more to add. Thank you. Thank you. The motion reads that council receives the staff report regarding application for site plan control approval file number SP06-2020 under the name Steve Crow Excavating Limited pertaining to parts two and four on plan 39R13559. The council resolves hereby grant site plan approval under section 41 of the Planning Act and directs staff to forward the site plan agreement to the owner for execution following resolution of any outstanding concerns if applicable to the satisfaction of municipal staff. And further, the council proceed to enact a bylaw authorizing the mayor and clerk to sign the site plan agreement pertaining to Steve Pro Excavating Limited 84 Sharp Road. Is there a mover? Moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc. Questions or comments from the council? Councillor Rowley. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, just just basically wondering why we're dealing with um, a planning issue in in this meeting. Uh, that might be my first question, or is this just some housekeeping paperwork that we are we just need to get to catch caught up on? Paul, just not sure. I think the simple answer is this is a meeting of council, and council can deal with planning issues at any of our regular meetings. Um, specifically, we deal with planning issues on the second month, second meeting of the month, but. 
we can deal with planning issues at any of our three meetings. Mr. Walsh, do you have any further explanation to that? Um, nothing really further, Mayor, just that uh, the applicant has expressed some um, time urgency with it. So is the matter of trying to provide some good service. And secondly, my plan controls, uh, given our type of arrangement or format, commonly go to council and not the planning council because there is no statutory public meaning associated with that kind of control. Thank you Any for others? that. Yeah. Thank you That's both. Good. Any further questions from members of council? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Thank you. Our next report is also a planning report. Application for site plan approval, 261640 Ontario Limited, Part 1 and 2, Conception 1, Registered Plan Number 28, Part 1, of Reference Plan 39R7036. And Mr. Oh, Mr. Ty joining us, or Mr. Walsh, are you fielding this? Uh, uh, Mayor, no, Mr. Ty is not available this evening, and uh, I can uh, attempt to answer any questions council may have. Uh, and the, the applicant is also, or the applicant's agent is also here to address any specific questions you may have of the proponent. Thank you. So, Mr. Walsh, do you have anything to add or highlight on this report? Further, Mayor? Thank you. The motion reads that council receives the report regarding an application for site plan approval SP04-2020 for 2616-480 Ontario Limited is prepared by the Municipal Planning Consultant. The Council resolves to hereby grant site plan approval under Section 41 of the Planning Act and direct staff to forward the site plan agreement to the owner for execution following resolution of all outstanding concerns to the satisfaction of municipal staff. And the Council proceed to an act of bylaw authorizing the Mayor and Clerk to sign the site plan agreement pertaining to 2616480 Ontario Limited following resolution of all outstanding concerns to the satisfaction of municipal staff. Is there a move? Moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc. Questions or comments from members of Council? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Thank you. The next report is uh, with regard to an Earth Day event, and it looks like this might be a verbal report. We didn't see anything in the package. Mr. Hagerman, do you have anything to uh, make comment on? Uh, just that uh, we're looking at doing something to help clean up the community after a long winter. Not sure what the uh, latest emergency break regulations are going to mean for this, considering. Um, uh, customer service is kind of tricky to provide at this at this juncture, so more to come. Uh, maybe after the emergency break, might have to wait till May to get this off the ground. But the community can expect that uh, at some point we'll we'll be having some sort of uh, trash bash, some sort of cleanup, something like that. Absolutely. Thank you. Any questions from members? Oh, sorry, I'll read the motion. Uh, the motion reads that council receive this report for information as it pertains to municipality of Brighton holding an Earth Day initiative. Is there a mover? Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor Anderson. Uh, questions or comments from members of council? Councillor Rowley. Thank you. I'd just like to make a, co make a comment and although we might have to postpone this for a little while, it's, uh, <coughs> it's great to see that some folks, some of the residents are out already just cleaning up neighborhood blocks and things like that. I've seen a lot of stuff and it's, I, I would I would hope without directing, but suggesting maybe that if our municipal staff is out picking up garbage, if they could maybe pick up some of the extra bags along the streets and roadsides that I see. Could we get that to public works? Mr. Councilman, will you pass that, uh, that, that little piece of uh, info along? 
Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. I just want to comment on that as well. I, I, I know with restrictions, it's difficult to do things, but uh, um, uh, we can all do our part to clean up as far as uh, 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 you know, garbage and that sort of thing um, without having a special event. I am looking forward to us doing something just to recognize it and to be conscious of, of what, uh, what uh, we need to be doing as stewards of this earth to take care of it. Thank you, Councillor Cadman. Thanks, Mayor. Maybe I, I could suggest that since we're a, a, a municipality with a bunch of individual hamlets all the way through, maybe we could have a challenge with each hamlet to see who could make their hamlet look the best and have a prize. It might get people out and picking up. And you don't have to have a whole bunch of people. If somebody takes one street or two people, you don't have to worry about social distancing or anything. You can just go get the job done. All, all good suggestions. I think uh, just from a municipal perspective, we have to be careful if we're organizing the event. Um, so I think that's where Mr. Hagerman's coming from in, in terms of wanting to push it uh, into a, a post lockdown. But certainly good suggestions for the community if they want to help clean up. There's no time like the present, quite frankly. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Rowley's comment, um, if people want to clean up, but they don't want to have to put bag tags on everything, is there a mechanism in place that we can be cleaning up and, and leaving the bags sitting there and, and they'd be picked up? Or, or are we just causing more issues? I just want to make sure that if anyone asks, I give the proper answer. Or if I feel like going out and cleaning up for a day. Mr. Councilman. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I think I think uh, what I would do is I would send uh, any inquiries to Public Works at this stage. I'll certainly, from a staff perspective, speak with Public Works and Parks and, Parks and Recreation uh, starting tomorrow, uh, along with Mr. Hagerman, to uh, make sure we're cognizant of uh, uh, the want of council to uh, clean up the community. Thank you, Councilor Tedman. I just wanted to say we certainly. Miss Alice Richardson, and I'm sure there's some other Alice's or Andy's out there that would like to take on that role. And you can really see the difference with Alice not there picking up all the time, especially going up Prince Edward Street and all along Main Street. And uh, so I'm sure there's some people out there just itching at the chance to take on her role. If we can get yeah, that out certain, to the public. No certain councillors out there uh, walking around and, and picking up garbage all over the place. So uh, I do that. He, he, he'll remain nameless for the moment unless he wants to chime in. Uh, anyone anyone else further comments on this motion? Councillor Anderson? I'll just add, uh, from my understanding, uh, the Rotary Club's planning something for the end of the month. Uh, and Earth Day is at the end of the month. Uh, I forget the exact date, the 25th rings a bell, but uh, so I'm not sure, what, 22nd? Thank you. Um, I know, uh, I think there's a number of small groups around, just like Mary was saying, uh, some are, I know some are in Gosport area. They're planning around that time as well. Um, however, we'll have to wait and see how the month plays out and and we're going to get some more news tomorrow, probably, on how that's going to happen. And uh, so let's be patient on it. And uh, but like individually, I think uh, the deputy mayor is correct. If you can do it, you do it yourself or with a partner. It, it'll go a long way too. So let's let's wait and see what happens here, though. Thank you. Anything further from members of council? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Can you tell me who moved and seconded again? Sorry. For Kim. On the right sheet. It was moved by Councillor Rowley and seconded by Councillor Anderson. Thank you. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tagman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Lorthing? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. That's carried. 
just looking at the time and realizing we have bylaws to get through, uh, as well as all these motions and correspondence and consent, uh, the consent agenda, and then an in-camera session. Um, Council, do you want me to just carry on with the agenda as is? I leave this up to you. Uh, it's your time. Or would you prefer if we move the mo notices of motion and motions to the end before question period? And if necessary, uh, we push them off to the next meeting so that we can get the other business of council done. Is that okay with everyone? Does anyone strongly object to that? All right, so Madam Clerk, I'm going to move the notice of motions number 11. I'm going to move number 11 to just before question period. And so for everyone else following along, that takes us to number 12, unfinished business, the rent abatement with the YMCA. So Mr. Castleman, do you have anything further to add with the, with, oh, sorry, I should do, I'm sorry. We didn't do the council fault direction follow-up list. I'll do that first. The council direction follow-up list, the council follow the council follow-up list revised from March 15th council meeting be received as information only to move please. Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman. And members of council, questions or comments on the council direction follow-up list? Councillor LeBlanc. On the uh, on the status of these uh, updates, it says active status status uh, status update. Is there any way we can do the? Is it like I asked this the last council meeting? Could they put fifty percent complete, seventy five percent, twenty five? Just saying active. I'm not looking for an end date, but to show where the activity is. Are you just about complete or not complete? Mr. Castleman, is there any way to get some uh, some info in there just to let us know what's being worked on and, and where things are at in the process? Um, happy, take, happy to take the direction of council. Do you need a motion for that or are you, you understanding what we're looking for there? I understand. Very well, thank you. We'll pay attention to the next one, Councillor Blanc, and see how well that works out for us. Councillor Tadden. Uh, am I correct uh, in believing that the hops, uh, whatever you call that thing, kiln, um, wasn't it not sold? Ben made no, do you know Ben about that? Yeah, that's part of the uh, memory junction property. So, uh, that can probably come off the list. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. Thank you for that. Anything further? Uh, Councilor Bateman. I was going to say it's up to uh, Mr. Kassman, the CAO. I, I would say number eight was updated tonight by the CAO, Jennifer Moore. And that was, or no, sorry, number 11, I think it is. Or it could be eight. The, the update on the Loomis Bridge. It was directing staff to come back with something on where that stood. And she, she spoke to that. There was also another one here on uh, inviting MPP David Pacini to speak to Bill 229. I think Bill 229 has passed. So do we still want him to come and outline what was in it or? No, I don't think we need to. We could read it ourselves if we wanted to. Yeah. Madam Clerk. Sorry, he's um, scheduled to come to the April 16th meeting. Or April 19th, sorry, April 19th meeting. Maybe maybe he'll speak to it then. Maybe. Okay. And if not, we can ask questions if we want. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Tadden. Hey, thank you once again, Mayor. Um, there is quite a bit of interest in interest in the uh, the hunting bylaw. I was wondering when it will be uh, scheduled to be on the agenda. Mr. Castleman. Um, 
We've just received the uh, final comments on April the 1st. So uh, staff are uh, collating uh, the various comments. We've got uh, quite a few, quite frankly, uh, once we've had an opportunity to collate the uh, responses to the draft plan, we'll be bringing you forward some recommendations for council's consideration. The earliest would be uh, at the next council meeting, uh, dependent on how quickly we get through the uh, various pieces of uh, input. Did you hear that, Councillor Tadman? Earliest would be April 19th, depending on how quickly they can disseminate the information they've received from the public. You're, you're muted, Mary. Sure. You, you were muted, Mary. We saw you talking, but we couldn't hear you. I said, whenever it happens, I'm looking forward to debating that with uh, Councillor LeBlanc. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure he's uh, looking forward to it as well. Councilor Bates. Uh, just a, another quick question on number three and not to put any pressure on Mr. Walsh, but with swimming season fast approaching, do we know when a report would be coming on the proposed enclosures around pools? Well, I think the mayor, Council, Councilor Bateman. Um, yeah. I can uh, bring that towards the top of the pile and, and see if that can't get to Council 119th as well. Did you catch that, Councillor Bateman? Yes, thank you. Good. Uh, anyone else? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rally. Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink. Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. And that's carried. Thank you. Now we will move to the rent abatement report, which was uh, moved off to this meeting. Um, so, Mr. Councilman, do you have anything further to add on this? Uh, this is uh, this is a carry forward from a, a previous report back in January. At that time, uh, staff made recommendations to uh, uh, give consideration to a further rent abatement for January and February. Uh, Council had a number of questions uh, with respect to the recommendation in the staff report at that time. Uh, so what I've done is I've conferred with the YMCA to answer those questions and have uh, supplemented uh, uh, the background information for council's uh, consideration. Thank you. With that, the motion reads that council authorize a rent abatement for the Brighton YMCA of 50% of amounts due for the period of January to February 2021. Is there a mover? Council LeBlanc, is there a seconder? Mm -hmm. Councillor Anderson? Questions or comments from members of council? Councillor Bateman. With the recent announcement, thank you, Mayor. With the recent announcement now that we're closed for the next 28 days, are we going to be considering this again or have they reached out? Because I don't think they're allowed to be open under the restrictions currently, any fitness facility, correct? So it could be another situation because they're not going to have any revenue coming in unless their members are paying their dues going forward. We could be doing this again. So I, I guess the question is, there been any correspondence since the announcement? Through you, Mr. Mayor, there has been none. And I, think, I, I think you're quite right, Councillor Bateman. We can probably anticipate uh, another yeah. request. It, yeah. You're quite right. I mean, they're they're shut down entirely, and uh, they're probably not getting any new memberships at the moment. No. So um, it would. I don't think it would shock anyone to see this come come again. Any further questions? Go ahead, Councilor Bateman. Yeah, just a quick follow up comment slash question, and I I fully understand and support what the Y does, not just our municipality, any municipality city or municipality that has a YMCA, they provide so many services and need, not just from the physical fitness aspect, but all the other stuff. 
But I know back on, I think it was July 19, 2018, under the previous council, you had passed the resolution for that task force to be put together for fundraising. And I don't think we got rid of that resolution. So I don't know if there's been any work towards that because we've got to have to have an end game, a, a strategy to become more self-sufficient. I don't think any facility will be 100% self-sufficient, but have we made any headway on that task force? Because I know COVID has impact. It was a good time period for it. So I just don't know where that stands. Like, you know, I'm sure there's lots of people in the community who would like to know what's the plan. I can I can tell council that the CEO of the YMCA asked me to join her on a uh, conference call about a month ago and and I asked her to please wait until after we were done our strategic plan refresh. I didn't know I didn't want to presuppose anything. Um, I believe Mr. Councilman and I are scheduled to talk to Eunice next week sometime. So we will, we will certainly bring that up. That's yeah. correct. But we will also bring up uh, the other stuff we talked about uh, with regard to recreation and and our task force, because I'm sure they'll want um, I'm sure they want to be involved in some way. And if I could just say, I, and I don't say that because I support them, because I think the Y is a valuable asset to any community. But it, it has to be stressful, not just for you know, because you've gone to this well probably several times. It's just the nature of the beast, and I'm sure from a resident standpoint. They want to know what the plan is moving forward. And even for the Y members themselves, it just seems like Groundhog Day. And I'm sure they see a light at the end of the tunnel with a more solid, a little more solid footing than what they have had. Fair comment. Councilor Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, can't, I, I agree with uh, Councilor Bateman's uh, comments, that's for sure. And I, um, know that although we have a satellite um why here are some of these requests coming also from Coburg and do we know if um when, when you say Eunice I know Eunice is kind of CEO over the umbrella of the Northumberland why um do we know what when you say that you know they don't qualify for the PPE because they have too many staff I don't think they have too many staff just in Brighton I'm guessing they have too many staff over the whole Northumberland, would could they not parcel that out a little bit? Does it not no, work the, that way? The charitable organization is the YMCA in Northumberland. Okay. Yeah. yeah and I, I think Eunice um, mentioned that at some point um, to council when she was here. Maybe not. Maybe I'm imagining it. Okay. Any further questions? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. That's carried. Thank you. Move into bylaws. The first bylaw is with regard to records classification and retention, and it reads that council gives a bylaw its first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to adopt the records retention schedule for the municipality of Bright. Mayor Mover. Deputy Mayor Vink. Seconded by Council Rowley. Questions or comments from members of council? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Council Ron Anderson. Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Todman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Mayor Brian Austin? Yes. It's carried. Your next bylaw is with regard to site plan control for pro excavating. And the motion reads that council gives a bylaw its first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and the clerk to execute an agreement between the corporation of the municipality of Brighton and Steve Crow Excavating Limited regarding a site plan agreement pertaining to lands located in part lot 33, concession B, specifically parts two and four on plan 39R, 13559 in the municipality of Brighton in the county of Northumberland. 
Madam Lady Mover, please. Councilor Bateman, seconded by Councilor Ramily. Questions or comments from members of council? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Thank you. Our next bylaw is with regard to site plan approval for 40 Butler Street. And the motion reads that council gives a bylaw, its first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and the clerk to execute an agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton and 2616480 Ontario Limited regarding a site plan agreement pertaining to lands located in part lot one and two, concession one, registered plan number 28, part one of reference plan. 38R7036 in the municipality of Brighton in the county of Northumberland. Is there a move? Moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Rowley. Questions or comments from members of council? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And that's carried. Thank you. Madam Clerk, I have a motion for the, this is for the consent agenda. I have a motion okay. in front of me that's 14.1 to 14.4. It should go to 14.6. It should. So members of council, um, we will, this is part of the consent agenda. So the motion will read that we, um, um, that we accept the information received in the consent agenda. If there's anything you want to discuss or debate on a separate item, would you let me know now? Councilor Bates. Not really debate or whatever. I was just going to mention on the DBIA minutes because I didn't know of a better spot to put it. And it's nothing that they've done. When I was out on a walk tonight, just before a council meeting, there's a short spot in between the two buildings. I think it's the mortgage company and uh, part of the Vito's complex. And I know it's not municipal and I know it's not the DBIA property, but I noticed it's been furnished for a place back there, but now there's a fridge back there. So I don't know who that can be placed to because I saw it and I thought that to me, it was a major safety concern with a fridge with the door still on it. I, I, as a safety aspect, I don't want to see any kids get in there and get trapped. So I don't know. I know this isn't the spot that that should have been mentioned, but it being a safety thing, I just saw it just before this meeting. I thought somebody should know about this. Thank Can you. I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I don't know about the fridge, Councillor Bateman, but I should say um, the DBIA, along with uh, some of our public works staff, I believe Ben Hagerman is involved as well on the uh, improvements to Casey Lane. I know that is, um, it's been noted that that needs to be cleaned up. But uh, as you say, now that there's a fridge with a, an open door there, maybe it should be looked after sooner than later. Um, yeah, I saw that today. But, uh, but there is consideration and right. it's it's been marked to uh, to clean that up as we uh, continue to beautify that, that whole uh, section there. Thank you both. Mr. Councilman, I saw you making notes. I assume that was with regard to that, especially the fridge concern. Yeah, yeah I'm getting a head nod, so we're good. And the motion reads, be it resolved that the staff recommendation with respect to consent agenda items 14.1 to 14.6 be adopted as printed. Is there a mover? Moved by Councilor Rowley, seconded by Councilor Bateman. Is there any further discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Chadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. That's carried. 
Thank you. Thanks. Moving into correspondence, direction items, endorsements, communications, and petitions. Our first piece of correspondence this is from Alan and Mary Bird regarding uh, sidewalks on Ontario Street, north from Raglan to Main Street. And the motion will read that council receive or support the correspondence from Alan and Mary Bird. So if you're the mover, I'll need to know whether you want to receive it or support it. Anyone? Councillor Tadman? Uh, receive it at this time with a note that uh, <clears throat> staff uh, has a plan for all sidewalks. Do you want me to add that to the motion, Councillor Tadman? Yeah, I would, please. Yeah, just uh, because I think it answers their query there. Further, Mayor, they could uh, they could speak to Public Works about when uh, the plan is to fix those sidewalks on Ontario Street. So the council received the correspondence from Alan and Mary Bird, noting that the municipality has a sidewalk plan. And when, right. when we get back to them, I'm I know that staff's also making a note here, so they'll be prepared to answer any questions that are directed. Okay, to that's good then. Yeah. Is there a seconder to that? Councillor Bateman? Any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And that's carried. Thank you. Next piece of correspondence comes from Nancy Crapper, the relocation of wild animals that do not belong in residential areas. And the motion reads that council receive or support, so the mover will have to let me know, uh, the correspondence from Nancy Crapper. The mover? Uh, move to receive it. Is there a seconder? Moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Wolf. The council received the correspondence from Nancy Crapper. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink and Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. It's carried. Thank you. The next piece of correspondence comes from Bill Graham seeking support for the Brighton YMCA. And the motion will read that council receive or support correspondence from Bill Graham. Is there a mover? Councillor LeBlanc, are we receiving or supporting? Supporting. Uh, I'll, I'll second that, Chair. I have a motion moved by Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Councillor Anderson, that Council support the correspondence from Bill Graham seeking support for the Brighton YMCA. Is there any discussion? Councillor Tedman. I think we already proved that we are supporting them. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Vink. You know, I think whether or not we uh, agree to rent abatement or not, it doesn't mean we don't support or support the why. Uh, every time that something comes to us, this is what happens. And it's not about supporting the why, it's wanting them to be, become self-sufficient. Um, we all want the why in this community. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, we, we know the benefit. So I just, I, I just uh, wanted to bring that up. Um, uh, supporting them doesn't mean that we're going to, we have to give them something every time they ask. Um, so anyway, I'll get in trouble for that comment, but I'm willing to. I agree with you, Laura. Councillor Tenton. So since we have been supporting them and always have, why do we do anything but receive this motion? 
if the two that moved it and second it would agree. Who moved and who's Can I just say, Councillor, sorry, Councillor LeBlanc as the mover, you've asked to support this correspondence. Uh, so I'll ask you to defend your decision. <laughs> <laughs> With what we just went on, I would say I would receive. But we already supported the motion anyway. So I'm, I was just going with the way direction that we voted. So I'll go with receive. It means the same thing. Thank you. Um, so as the mover, oh. we're moving back to receive. Councillor Anderson, are you still okay to be the seconder? Can I just explain why I say support? It's sure. I think, uh, Mr. What's it, Mr. Blair, you wrote it. I think his, his comments were excellent. I think it's the sentiment of a lot of people in town. There are people that are uh, that do a, not objecting. They just feel their tax dollars should be going to more bricks and mortar, perhaps, or something, uh, some other service. But um, I think uh, Councillor or Deputy Mayor made it very, very clear that support is we. There's a service that this community really needs in the, now and in the future, and to lose it. And you may never see anything like it. We don't have any public health clubs or anything like that. Uh, I think that's even in his letter. So I'm supporting his statement, not necessarily just receiving it. I'm supporting his statement. So I hope uh, Councillor LeBlanc might reconsider and stick with that. If not, I will second uh, Councillor LeBlanc's uh, motion, whichever way he wants to go. Back to you, Councillor LeBlanc. With, 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 with uh, Councillor um... Ron Anderson's strong uh, debate and everything. I will stay with support. <laughs> I'm going to go to Councillor Tadman, see if she can convince you to go back to receive. Councillor Tadman. What a fickle pair these two are. It's We're the mother of Councillor LeBlanc. You said, you said you would receive it. And uh, uh, Ms. Councillor Anderson said he would support whatever you did. So let's get on with this. Well, he just the changed it. Reads that Councilor LeBlanc moves and Councilor Anderson seconds that Council support the correspondence from Bill Graham. Is there any further discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowling? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? As much as I, I like Bill Graham and all, I have to stand by my word here and say no. Okay. We've already supported them. Deputy Mayor Laura Ving. Going with Councillor Tadman on this, I'm going to say no. I don't think it's the proper terminology. Thanks. Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. It's carried. Thank you. The next piece of correspondence comes from Des Rodriguez, commemoration for Marie Francisco. And I'll need a mover and a seconder that council receive or support correspondence from Des. Des how do you say his first name? I know him as Des. Des Rodriguez in the commemoration of Marie Francisco. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Vink. Is, are we receiving or supporting? Um, my request is to support, and I'd like to add a little bit to it. Go ahead. Um, well, I would like to uh, support it and suggest that maybe um, I hate to give staff this job, but it's, it's our proper mode to ask staff to recommend to us what is the best route to go to commemorate, whether it be um, a garden or a bench or uh, an area to put that, unless members of council have ideas on, on where we want to go with that. But I think it's actually something important as a community that we recognize um, uh, this uh, tragic uh, event that happened um, a number of years ago. And uh, and I, I really appreciate the, the letter that we received. Sorry, I'm talking too much before we even have it on the floor. Okay, it's your motion. You're just making the motion at this stage. stage. So what I've added, Deputy Mayor, is and refer to staff for a recommendation. Is that fair? I'll second that. Yes. Thank you. So it's moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council supports correspondence from Des Rodriguez in commemoration of Marie France Como and refer to staff for a recommendation. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Rowley. If memory serves me correct, um, and this isn't to kind of delay this whole discussion as well, but I do believe the previous mayor. Um, purchased a, a, a stone, I think we have a stone in Memorial Park already recognizing 
uh, Ms. Como was, am I correct? I believe you are correct, yes. So do we do two things? Um, I, I think it's appropriate. I think the Stone in Memorial Park uh, recognizes her as a serving member of the armed forces who um, had a tragic death in our community, but I think it would be appropriate given the circumstances surrounding her, um, her end of life here in Brighton that we have a, an appro appropriate, an appropriate, uh, a more significant commemoration. So I, I, I'm supporting the motion by uh, the Deputy Mayor and Councilor Tadman. Councilor Tadman? Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I, I would hope that we would be reaching out to her family when we have the commemoration. And I don't know, for me, I like to have something like a tree that's planted in memory, but uh, maybe the staff will have other ideas. We have quite a few benches, but I, a, a living tree, I think is a really nice memorial. Thank you for that. Any further questions or comments? A name of a park might be nicer. There you go. There's a suggestion for staff, Deputy Mayor. Uh, yeah, I like the tree idea as well, and I'm just wondering if there is a spot in Memorial Park where we need to plant another tree. That might be the, the ideal area. But anyway, those are just suggestions, and uh, I am open to hear what staff thinks as being most appropriate. Thank you. Anything further from members of council? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Raleigh? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Thank you. And our final piece of correspondence comes from Helen Dyson, the Timber House Resort Residents Association. And I'll note for Council's information that we all received a letter from uh, this organization or the association back at the beginning of December. Um, I was waiting to uh, get the okay from the association to have something put on the agenda. And I received the correspondence that is on the agenda saying, uh, you know, let's, let's go ahead and put it on there. But we've also included the, uh, the original correspondence for you was sent out by email today. Just as a reminder, we scanned in and sent out as an email. So the motion reads that council received the correspondence from Helen Dyson, Timber House Resort Residents Association. Is there a move? Councillor Anderson. Is there a second? Councillor LeBlanc. Is there any discussion? Uh, can I ask a question? I didn't hear, did they receive or did they support? Receive. Received. Um, okay. Uh, I guess we have to write based on uh, the email that we got late in the day from Candace as well. I think I think it's the most appropriate uh, way to go. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anything further from members of council? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councilor Ryan Anderson. Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman. Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rally? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Thank you. So members of council, it's 9.22 p.m. We still have to go into camera to have uh, two pieces of discussion. Um, do we want to go back and deal with notices of motion and motions, or do we want to defer them to the next meeting of council? Sorry, Mr. Councilman, you had your hand up there. Uh, prior to uh, debating with council, we have uh, a couple of items on the in-camera agenda, one of which is to hear some advice from a solicitor. He's scheduled to join us at 9.30. Right. Well, we won't be able to get through these in seven minutes by the I time see. we take a break and, and go out. So if it's okay with everyone, um, I'm going to draft a motion to defer section 11 notice of motions and motions to the April 
19th. Is that the next meeting? Yes. April 19th council meeting. With a special request that we not add to this list for that meeting. That's just, you can wait till May council of law, I promise. We read, we read all of your notices of motion, all of them. Do you need a motion? Do you need a motion? Need a motion yet. <laughs> Councilor Rowley, you have a question? Yeah, just a question. Are any of these, um, without just going through all the papers right now, are any of these time sensitive that they have to wait till May? It's... Not till May, till April 19th. Or till April? I, I yeah. don't think any of them are I, terribly time sensitive. I, I don't think uh, the two that I'm involved in are. I'm just wondering if the rest of Council have any. Yeah, no. and, and some of them we've dealt with, well, at least one of them we dealt with through strategic planning also, so it's already underway. So I think we're, I think we're okay getting, getting these off, off of this agenda. So the motion raised the council, I already read this, right? The council defers section 11 notice of motions and motions to the April 19th council meeting. Is there a mover? Uh, Long, seconded by Councillor Bateman. Uh, motion to defer is not debatable. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Babin? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. Carried. Thank you. And Madam Clerk, are you aware of anyone joining us to ask a question during question period? No, I'm not. Oh. But I do think that we should extend the meeting first. I think you're right. <laughs> so the motion will read the council, extend the meeting to its natural conclusion. Is there a mover? by Councilor LeBlanc, seconded by Councilor Rowley. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Link? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And it's carried. Thank you. It takes us to our resolution to move into closed session. And it reads that council resolve itself into closed session April 6, 2021 at 19 at 9 26 p.m. Pursuant to the Ontario Act RSO 2001, subsection 239 2F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege and communications necessary for that purpose, specifically Lake Ontario flooding. And K, a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board, specifically a collective agreement with QP Local 5085. Mr. Mover. Councilor Rowley, seconded by Councilor Bateman. Discussion? I'll ask the clerk to call the vote, but before that, I'll um, remind uh, members of the public who are joining us by YouTube that the YouTube session will end for the duration of the council meeting. And thank you for joining us. And also to let you know that once the motion is read, we will take a 10 minute recess before uh, joining each other back at the, at the other link, the other Zoom link uh, for the closed session. So there is a separate Zoom link. Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Link? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Thank you. So everyone, please join us on the closed session Zoom link at 9.38 p.m. And we'll see you in 10 minutes, everyone. Thank you.